Okay, uh, so we're um, asking dumb uh, SEO questions. Um, each week we answer the questions asked on the dumb SEO questions community on Google+. Plus. Um, with us tonight we have uh, Alistair Lattimore from Convergent Media. Uh, Alistair is a consultant uh, brand name, for brand name sites uh, worldwide and also manages uh, the uh, online activities of the Mantra Group. Andy Wigglesworth uh, is a web architect to the world. He uh, uh, currently confers his favours on Doncaster in the middle of England. And uh, my son Elliot is here tonight. That's my boy. Um, Elliot um, just recently wrote some code for Google that even Google can't write um, for Google Apps. Um, and uh, Lyndon, um, Lyndon Na, uh, autocrat, um, um, the owner only SEO that uh, Googlebot is afraid of. Um, Autocrat was banned from uh, the Google Help forums for helping people too much. Um, Masataki Wasa um, is a top contributor on the AdSense and the Google Plus forums. Uh, and uh, I hope I got that right this week, Masataki. Uh, cool. Um, Micah Fishnik Kirshner um, is. Uh, um, a digital, digital, digital brand leader, a digital a marketing lead, digital marketing lead um, for Balsam Brands uh, in uh, the United States. Um, and uh, Rob Wagner runs Link Builder Workroom uh, in the USA. And Tim Kappa looks after uh, the lifestyles of Russian oligarchs and. Uh, um, <laughs> His only complaint is that they keep dying on him. And um, he runs a website for reputation management um, called onlineownership.com. And Micah Fisher Kirshner, I should have described as an organic marketer, should I? Or am I just reading the chat wrongly? Okay. Oops. <laughs> All right, uh, our first question, um, this, I, thought, I thought I was being very clever because I, I put a link to the first question in the chat and now you guys have disappeared it on me. Um, this is a question from Melissa Claver. Melissa asks, hello everyone, I'm brand new to this community and have only been working on SEO for less than a year so I have tons of questions. I research regularly, but my questions are specific to my ongoing pro projects, so I would appreciate any advice. My first question concerns a site we are about to launch. My company purchased the domain name, but the boss instructed the programmer's developments to include it within our company site with a separate domain name. For clarity, I hope we haven't had this question before. Uh, okay. Um, www companysite.com is the original 11-year-old company site. www.newsite.com can be found with its URL but then shows up as www.companysite.com slash about. Could somebody please explain to me how this affects the SEO for both sites? I can't answer this one, so uh, I have. So in comments to this question, I didn't think the question itself clearly explained it, but what's happened, I think, is that the second site is using a frame to frame in content or vice versa from the other site. If that helps people. Uh, answer the question. I would say just in general, um, linking from one business website to a related business website is completely fine. Um, even if it's in the primary navigation, that's still completely fine. Uh, but it makes no sense what they're doing at the moment in terms of framing content or embedding sites within sites. Um, she should just link from um, oldsite.com to newsite.com in the navigation. Just like a plain standard link. And the content that's on newsite.com 
should be completely self-contained within that site. The branding of the two sites could be similar for, for all the user needs to care about. It could carry the same masthead across the top of both sites so the users can easily switch back and forth between the two domains. Um, that would be completely fine. But in terms of the content, the content for oldsite.com needs to live on oldsite.com. The content for newsite.com should live on newsite.com. Um, and it should link cleanly between the two. And you, should, you definitely shouldn't be able to access old site content on the new site domain or vice versa. That's, that's a really key point in this. Otherwise, I'll end up in scenarios where all content from both domains will get indexed under both domains. Um, and it causes a duplicate content issue for Google, which just in general is not ideal. Cool. Uh, thanks for saving my life there, Alice. <laughs> Um, we had uh, some technical issues when we first started. Is it better now, guys? Yeah, cool. Okay, um, our next question um, is from James Swede. He says, good evening, everyone. I have a technical question for all you fantastic boffins. The blog on our website is still getting posts well ranked by Google, but most of the blog URLs are now, by, now being indexed by Google as numbers, not by the URL we create. They're also, they're also showing in analytics as blogs slash 123456, etc., making it hard to identify them. We have checked the permalinks in WordPress and they are unaltered, so it's a mystery. We also asked about the issue on the Webmaster Central, but no one has answered. It, it seems to be inundated over there with Panda and Penguin. Suggested reasons and uh, advice appreciated on this bizarre issue. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Come on, and you're, you're a WordPress aficionado, aren't you? Uh, surely you can answer this for me. Uh, I'm just looking now. Hold on. Well, while we're waiting for Lyndon, uh, um, well, look, my take in this, on this is, is, is that um, um, if, if Googlebot is uh, indexing these pages, it's because they're available. Um, and, and so it, it sounds to me like uh, in, in, in the WordPress setup, um, you, you ha uh, I, I don't use WordPress myself, but um, um, I, I'd imagine they have alternatives of, of um, listing sites, either as... Um, by the by, the post number, or by the category it belongs to, or by the date that it was posted, and so on. So, um, I, I'd be checking the um, the, the uh, configuration panel. Uh, it, there, there is a configuration panel in WordPress, isn't there, guys? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we can come back to that, uh, Lyndon. If you if if you uh, come up with uh, um, you know, something more than that. Um, the next question uh, is, um, oh, look, I'll, I'll pass on this one. This uh, it was just a, a comment from uh, Vipal Jain who said he wants to do uh, SEO summit training in India and uh, he asked for suggestions on organizations uh, that he could do that at. Um, this is one that I added. Um, I'm happy to, um, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely ask it. Um, I, I added this because it was it was a post um, uh, made by um, Lyndon, and uh, he asked, could this be construed as a paid link? And um, uh, it, it, it was um, a study uh, sponsored uh, on w3.org and um, at the bottom of the study which I think was about a PR6 or something 
or thereabouts, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't, I'm not sure. But anyway, there was a, a followed link. Um, I think it's a sponsored link. I think it's absolutely a sponsored link. Um, and you know, uh, like it, it, it's an advertising link, and, and uh, should should be no followed. But uh, anyway, so there was some discussion about it. Um, and Tim Kappa said there are too many ifs and, and what ifs created by G. Um, okay, um, can somebody uh, cover this one for me? This is a wind up, isn't it? You, you guys planned this and, and, and you, you're set, <laughs> setting me up. <laughs> Nothing. Well, uh, well, I have a question. Okay, yep. so so this is this is about um, <clears throat> if like here in the United States we have um, I think it's a Red Cross or, or something that if people are, have links on their pages that that sponsor blood drives. So if if there are a, if if you have a link on the Red Cross's website because you sponsor a blood drive, your corporation that sponsors that. And it's a follow link. Is that considered a sponsored link? To get closer to home, how many of the um, conference links that you may go to that are hosted, mm -hmm. Search Marketing Land uh, or the, the Expos, they have their own as well. I haven't checked actually recently if those are followed or not. So. I think there's a difference, though, between kind of something that's sponsored and something that's considered to be a, a paid link. I think there are kind of differentiations between what we define in that regard. So uh, th this is a difficult one simply because of where the line blurs, right? A paid link is something that you're doing simply to manipulate search rankings. If you're a sponsor for an event, you, you could have no interest in um, your website. It might not be a commercial website at any level, for instance. You simply want to sponsor it because there they could be an amazing charity. Um, and the fact that they link to your website, it could be a one-page brochure site that says, call me. And, and there's no commercial component to it at all. You could be another charity um, who's a not-for-profit, a not for profit, at which point the link still doesn't sort of necessarily carry any financial benefit for you. So I think that the issue here is probably more to do with the intent of the link. For instance, if, if you were sponsoring a search conference like SMX Sydney or whatever it might be, it would make complete sense that the event would link to, naturally link to, the people who are presenting at the conference or the companies that are going to be at the conference. Whether the, the people that are coming to the conference to present their services are paying rent on the floor space to be there or not, it's probably neither here nor there in the grand scheme of things because the conference organiser wouldn't allow them to come to the conference if they didn't endorse their product to some degree. So in that regard, I would argue that um, having their logo linked from their conference website to the vendor's website is probably, I would argue, would be kind of editorial. It would be no different than a blog reviewing the same business um, and saying that they've got a great service or a crappy service. If, if you're doing it to manipulate search rankings, then that's a different scenario, I think. Well, who, yeah. determines, who determines that, though? Um, who, that's Google, right? It's going to determine whether you've done it for link manipulation or not. I, I, I mean, I saw a very well-known SEO person said uh, in a speech that they got a link from... American Red Cross because he donated a, a blood drive or you know sponsored a blood drive and so one of the link building techniques that they use that they suggested was is is you know do charity work as part of your company culture if you're doing charity work that's one way that you could possibly get a link um, I think that's it's a long about way of doing it I, I think that's a little bit over the top to do that just for the link. So maybe that's the assumption there that if you're going to do a blood drive or, or sponsor some research for uh, a nonprofit, maybe that's the criteria. 
So, but, but what is that criteria? Is that it's just not known? It's there's not like a there's not a rule. It's a judgment call, and, and that's a question. I mean, is it Google judging that? So, like I looked on the Red, American Red Cross, looked at corporate sponsors. One of the corporate sponsors were Circle K stores. The link went to the homepage of the Circle K store uh, corporate website. So to me, that's you know they they're sponsoring uh, a blood drive at the corporate level, blood drives for their stores, and they're getting a link from there, and it's a follow link. So I would assume that they're trading something of value, and they get a link out of it. Right. That so doesn't that, necessarily that a, imply that it's a paid link in of itself. Well, yes, and I completely agree with you. I would say that it's not, but from from coming from uh, the Google, looking at it through Google goggles here a little bit and say, okay, well, you traded something of value and you got a link. So if I decide that I'm going to do something for Alistair's charity and I do it on my small little website and he puts a link to me are they going to look at me and say you know you you traded something of value how do they how does Google determine that so it's a I think it's a judgment call yeah mm, and it's don't disagree strictly, on that. yeah it's strictly it's strictly if it's American Red Cross and you have a link from the American Red Cross good for you if if you have some small little unknown charity uh, they, they may not have the trust so it's I think it's a trust factor I think if Google trusts the site and it's a nonprofit and there's a link on there and it's a follow link they're just gonna let that pass it's yeah I, I, I think they're basically kind of you know one or two things here or there they're gonna let pass but if your whole profile is suddenly filled as a corporation let's say for a lot of charity links they're gonna kind of look at that a little more in detail and see if that's looking to be done as, as an actual link building tactic rather than as something more altruistic right I, I don't I just don't I don't see so, now oh, the one the, the link that we're talking about I, I don't know about that I, I mean the link that we're actually talking about on w3c somebody sponsored from my understanding, from what I read, correct me if I'm wrong, I, and and I'm just going by memory here, that it was a, a funded research that was done. And, and they got a link on that site. I would say that if I funded research for a website, that and that was clearly stated on the article, and it was a follow link, that I would be hit with a penalty. So I think it goes back to it has to be some type of, of judgment call based on trust because if, if otherwise you would get – it's clearly something that you could easily say was done, the research was done, and they got a link out of it. The same way that if I go out and I do a, a – uh, a research paper and I put a link on a website and I pay for that and that links it and they put a link back to me um, that's paid right I'm paying that I'm paying to be there or am I completely wrong you see this is why I brought it up because I do think there's a fairly large space in between definitely acceptable Definitely not. Now, in this case, it looks like the content was written by Party A. They link back to Party A's own website with examples. Then they include a, this content is sponsored by, with a link to Party A's homepage. I have no objection to creating content and linking back to your own resources if they're relevant. What I don't understand is the sponsored by. There was absolutely no need for that homepage link. Well, 
so it says enabling funder, whatever that means. So I looked up the definition of enabling and funder, and basically what it says is they, they it's basically finance. It's money changing. So uh, there's other definitions to that, but that's the idea. Funder is is money is changing. So the development of this publication is being funded by this group. The content of this publication does not necessarily reflect the views of the policies of that group, nor does mention of trade names, commercial products, or organizations imply endorsement by that said group. Yeah. You see, technically, the links are unnatural because they were made by the post writer. So what we're looking at is basically an upper class equivalent of a guest post with links back to the guest post author's own site. I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't see it as a as a uh, equivalent of a guest post. I see it as a, the equivalent of this group paid somebody, and and that somebody was eventually gave this content to W three, and they placed it on their website. Well, so the is we don't know if there was a change of monies or if it was services or just the content. Because for all we know, they may have written 5% of the content on that site and donated it for that site. Yeah, enabling funder really is kind of, uh, that, that has a connotation to it. Right? I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it sounds fiscal. It sounds like money, but we can't confirm it. No. I, I, I don't Does it matter? I, I don't know what an enabling funder is, but I'd certainly like to meet one. I don't think it matters what what it, it what matters is, is to me what matters is is this, this something of value exchanged hands from yeah. this group to W3. So if that's the case that goes against the terms of service. Right it's clear you can't you can't exchange uh, money or goods or something of value uh, for a link. Now on the on this right down to it that's the bottom line. Well, you, slight modification to that. It, it's, right. it can't be guaranteed link. Right. So and that makes a difference. So Yahoo's directory is perfectly acceptable. Right. Well, um, that's well, that that goes back to um, you know uh, a review process. Yeah. So if not, and we don't know is, if there's a review process for this that right. as a funder, and we don't even know if they specifically paid to have that. Like we, we don't know W three C just put it up on their own, and so be it. So, well, that I guess that's what the 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 problem is. Is for me a little bit is who determines that? I mean, well, I, 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 you know, how many people have gotten penalized by by Google? Because they look at a link and say it must be paid. It well, must it's be not just, it's well, not just that. We had a, who was it before who who basically was starting up a link bait business, and, and essentially got slapped because they were a well known SEO. They were what SEO? They were well known SEO. Oh, one of the oh, that was uh, yeah, um, yeah. I can't remember. That was a while back, wasn't it? Like last year or something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was a while back, more than a year ago. But like, it, it's that type of thing where essentially, if you're you're in a set area, and it goes back to that, whether it's intent or just kind of what you're known for. Uh, so, yeah, okay. I, I I think it's a gray area. It's, it's very gray. Um, it it's it's you know, and that goes back to is this going to be triggered? So does a paid link, if, if somebody catches somebody buying a link or, or whatever, uh, is that done through an algorithm or is that done through a manual review? So uh, if you can't tell, if the algorithm, an algorithm can't tell, but what, it, you know, even Barry Schwartz blog was on a manual penalty. So you can't necessarily, I don't know this for sure, but if an algorithm can't, can't flag this link and say it's a paid link, then it's it's a manual penalty or it's a manual review. So if somebody actually turned this page in and said, "Hey, is this a, this is a paid link?" it 
would be under a manual review. That's a judgment call, right? Yeah, so right, but the problem is oftentimes, at least publicly, people don't have a perception of what an algorithm can or cannot do. Right. They they either overestimate or underestimate. I think most people overestimate, personally myself. But um, yeah. Well, it'd be hard for me. It would be hard for me to 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 think that uh, the algorithm is going to pick this up and flag it as a paid link. That that's just to me that doesn't. I just don't see that happening. Yeah. And and and, and, it, and enabling funder is a good one too if you're trying to avoid like, right phrases. Right. So if you, if it's a sponsor, maybe that's a little different story. But then again, you know that even that even that it could you you can't just every time there's sponsor on a web page flag it as there's a paid link on that page. So there has to be <laughs> to, in my mind there has to be somebody at the switch here. And somebody at the switch seeing that they're going to investigate where the link goes, that website, the, the trust of that website, and it's W3C's website. So I, I say that they put, put it together and said, look, these guys aren't manipulating anything, but and, and give it a pass. Or maybe not. Maybe they did penalize this, like Jim mentioned, and um, they did have a page rank adjustment. And, and adjusted the page rank on this particular page. Maybe that is the case, and we just don't know it. See, that's why yeah. I'm so against the whole page rank modifi modification, because it's a joke. The only people that will know is the people that yeah. are um, Otherwise, you'll never know there was a page rank modification. Oh, that's... that's well, unless you're monitoring it, or uh, well, back in the day... You, well, there were people who actually had... Remember, there was a whole... Uh, aspect of there was a hidden way of finding out if you had been penalized. There was what? like HVIE, like there was a way back in the day where if you put in a, a, a set subdomain, you theoretically yeah. could see. Yeah, there, there was a separate index thing, wasn't there? Yeah, they, yeah, supposedly. I don't know if it was true or not, if, uh, if a link builder had gotten connections inside of Google. Um, I don't know, but that that was kind of one of the story back then. Uh, um, the other thing I want to raise is that the dance that Googlers do on what's acceptable and what's not. Now, I've been in Hangouts where Googlers have categorically stated there is nothing wrong with sending out samples of your products to established bloggers to get a review. And it is perfectly fine if they happen to link to you in that review if they do it. And yet now, I'm pretty sure, guidelines state you are not allowed to do it. You're not allowed to send out samples in return for a link. That's right, but I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's... Go ahead, Micah. Oh, uh, it's just, it, it goes back to in return for a link or in exclusion or beyond kind of what would be considered normal. I think, to be fair, I think it's just, or to you know, try to take Google's side for this part, it, it's not to exploit a single tactic that could have, you know, for the purpose of a link or indirectly in terms of a link. It, it's making sure you don't do it in excess. I think a lot of it would be easier if they kept more and more saying, like, you know, it's about not doing it in excess of one single thing. Yeah. See, to me, though, the confusion is, is technically you're allowed to send off products for a review, and if the reviewer links to you at their own discretion, it's fine. If you send the product off asking for a review and a link, then it's bad. How the blazes is Google going to know? Does that well, mean maybe maybe they don't even try to know and, and just rely on um, paid link reports um, uh, via the uh, paid link reporting tool? Well, this is it though. Is you could actually be doing it the right way, and someone could class you as paying links, report you, and you could get slapped for it, while your competitor who is buying links gets away with it because no one's reported them. 
Now, as far as I'm aware, we're looking at thresholds and checks and balances. You can get away with buying a handful of links if you've got a hundred organic ones. And it goes up in scale. But the concern is, is the number of people that are now going, I can't do this, I can't do that, the guideline says that's bad too. Whereas some of us will be doing it because we know it's actually safe. Yeah, it, it's it's a nice kind of segue as well into the consideration of of more and more of the guilty until proven innocent or innocent until proven guilty kind of style, or at least more of what kind of you're saying is potentially a, a lowering of, of thresholds yeah. of what you used to be able to do, and now you know you can only do as much before you are specifically penalized for it. Well, we're rapidly reaching the point where just thinking about buying a link may get your wrist slapped. <laughs> um, it is... I wouldn't mind if it weren't for the fact that I can look in the SERPs and see sites that have bought links. If there weren't any, I'd be cheering. The problem, of course, it goes back to, yeah, you can see it, but how much of that... It, there's also the historical side of things where it's like, okay, if you do it from X point on... You know, we're going to do that, or that maybe they've actually discounted those links and they've got a lot of other things that have played a part now since. Now you sound like a Googler, right? My not uh, <laughs> It's not trying to sound like, I'm just trying to point out there are other, there's always other possibilities. And yes. I, trust me, I completely agree. I see sites and it's like, why? Yeah, this, this is pure, you know, I know why this is here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, I think... Google have done wonders with the information they are putting forth in many cases. But when it comes to this area, they still suck. Because they're not scaring the SEOs, they're not scaring the link builders, they're scaring the pants out of the innocent, though. Which may be the intended purpose. They want to limit most of the sites to do that. Yeah, but the innocent aren't looking at buying links. They're scaring the wrong people. So it's like, how can we define a paid link from a sponsored link? How can you tell if something's volunteered or something's arranged? Because it's bloody hard at times doing it manually. I, I think that's, that's just it. I think you're going to have some websites are going to get away with a lot more because um, you're, you're not going to get a you're not going to get a manual review on those sites. If, no. if the site gets a manual review and you get caught, you could get, be in serious trouble. Yep. But then you know if you do get a manual review, you have a way to get out of it with a reconsideration request. If you do something that's going to cause a, a penalty with Penguin or Panda, then that's a different story um, because then you you're you're working against um, the algo. Uh, current, so to speak. So if if you push the envelope in that in that direction, there's certain ways you can push the envelope and get away with it to a certain degree. But I would be I would be very cautious about doing that. Although you know I have a business, and if I want to do charity work, I'm going to include my business as a sponsor in that charity work, and I may get a link out of it. it I'm not using it as a link building tactic. If you are using it as a link building tactic, and you have uh, a certain percentage of your links are coming from all nothing but charities, it could raise a red flag on a manual review. I don't think it would raise a red flag in an algo uh, by the algorithm. Same, the same way with sending out products. If, if, all your review, if all of your links are coming from review sites or review type articles, if somebody comes in and takes a look at that from Google, on a manual basis, you could get in trouble, but and they could say everything is coming from a review. So, so you can, you can, yeah, you could say the same thing for a charity, though. You could say you could, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's, I, I it's mean, just what's in excess, right? So, let's say yeah. I have an annual. Well, I mean, hey, I've worked for, work, you know, we had, we have a, a food drive, and we got mentioned in in the local newspaper, and we also got mentioned, um, it. You know, it, on the website with the food drive, I wasn't done. That it was clear that it wasn't done for a link. 
I mean, it would just not the effort that we the effort that we put into that and the people involved was it was not worth a link, right? So you could clearly, if somebody from a, somebody came in and had a manual review on that, they could clearly see that this was not done for a link. Assuming depends on how they look for the manual review. If if they're not if they're all they're doing, let's say, is taking a look at the links in aggregate of what you were doing, add up. They're not going to look at, oh, did they get PR? Like, did you get PR for this? They're going to look at, let's just take, you know, does it look spammy for right. a specific page or for the site as a whole, regardless of how right. necessarily worthwhile. Your total profile is going to be taken, is going to be looked at. So, yes, that's true. But I, I don't think that we have to, but I think back to this case, is you're innocent until proven guilty. However, I think there's a huge amount of of trust factor that goes into that. So if you have a lot of trust, you can you can do things like this. If for, for, trusted, for a manual, I'd say for a manual. For manual, right. Yeah. For manually, you, if you have a lot of, like if you're American Red Cross, you have a lot of trust. You're, you're not necessarily trying, you know, the American Red Cross is not trying to manipulate the search <laughs> results, right? They're a charity. The W3, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> theoretically, yes. But, you know, the W3, the same thing. You could look at it and say, look, the content on this website is is a number one. You're not going to get any better and in this regard for this niche. So um, why would you penalize that site? Right? So it's a lot of trust factor there. I think it boils down to that, especially on a, on a manual review side. You know, if I'm uh, if I'm looking at that website on that particular link, I'm going to say, yeah, well, maybe they did something, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm not going to penalize this site because I have a lot of trust in this site. But it may sound like it is based on the uh, uh, unnatural link warning you get in or your uh, there are issues on your site that you get from in, within Google Webmaster Tools. Sorry, what that was a joke on the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look, if I can, if I've understood uh, all of you guys correctly, uh, and, and just pull me up if I don't cover it all, but um, it, it, it's a, a lot related to the the, the site uh, that the link appears on, um, and that Google can um, monitor. Um, if the uh, link buying transaction takes place online, but certainly can't offline, um, so uh, that, that that that's that's another factor. And the, the other thing we have to think of is that um, if it's being uh, manually reviewed, it, it'll be as a result of somebody making a report uh, using the, the uh, paid link reporting tool on on um, um, on. Um, by Webmaster Tools, and uh, so if somebody is reporting another site that, uh, for, for buying a link, they might even have evidence to provide uh, to the engineer uh, that's looking at the case um, to 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 say that yes, it is um, it is being purchased. Is that is is that somewhere close to to uh, summing up what we've all said? Um, I think there's also the possibility that it's got a scouting algorithm to flag things that it's not 100% sure on but should be looked at. Um, so a sort of partial merge between algorithmic and manual. It's also going to be based on factors like your background profile, trust of your site, trust of the linking site, the link text used, the percentage of links you've got of that nature number of links from that source compared to the number of links elsewhere. Um, it can be complicated, I think. Yeah, I, mean, I must say, if I ever get feral and uh, I won't buy links, so I'll just use a man in the middle attack and, uh, and just whack my links onto all, all the other sites in the network. Um, but. Uh, can we, should we move on to the next one? Do you want to um, take one step back, Jim, to James's yep. question about his strange did indexing problem? Did I miss one? Did I? No, no, we talked about it, but we 
didn't have an answer for it straight away. I just had a bit um, of an investigation while you guys were chatting. Oh, okay. All right. So, but we're right to move on from um, the, the, the paid link question. I right. think so. <laughs> okay. Yep. James uh, Swede uh, says, uh, uh, I'll just read the question again. Good evening, everyone. I have a, a, a technical question for all of you fantastic boffins. Boffins. Okay. Um, the blog on our website is still getting posts well ranked by Google, but most of the blog URLs are now being indexed by Google as numbers, not by the URL we create. They are also showing in analytics as blog slash one, two, three, four, five, six, etc., making it hard to identify them. We have checked the permalinks in WordPress and they are unalter unaltered, so it's a mystery. Um, we also uh, asked about the issue on Webmaster Central, but no one has answered. It seems to be inundated over there with Pandu and Pe Penguin, please. Um, suggested reasons and advice appreciated on this bizarre issue, thanks. Uh, well, I is this the one from earlier? Yep. yep. Yeah, I had a quick look. Canonicals seem fine. Internal links seem fine. I've looked at some of the cases. I'm not seeing evidence of the URLs changing. Um, what I can find, though, is an external blog linking to their content with the same type of URL that they're reporting. So I'm wondering if something is confusing Google and overriding the canonical based on links. So what? what are, yeah, I basically found the same thing, Lyndon. So th there's two things here that I noticed that I think are causing the issue. If you look at some of the cached pages from um, in Google Cache from several months ago, they didn't carry any canonical tags at all. Right. And you can navigate to a URL using the, the short link, so question P equals number. Yep. So if the third parties are linking to their site with P equals number, Google's going to crawl it and index it. And since they don't have canonical tags and they're not 301 redirecting, guess what happens? You get yep. two copies of the page. Um, and, and that's also why in Google Analytics they're seeing page numbers show up in Google Analytics. So the only, the only way that that would happen otherwise is if they had a custom installation of Analytics where um, instead of letting the default track page view function fire, they passed in their own argument to track page view, i.e. instead of using the document URL, which is the pretty permalink, they specifically override that to pass in the number, which they're not doing. So it's likely that the reason they were seeing the numbers is what Lyndon described. People linking to it, and then they initially view the page with numbers. Their subsequent page view within the site would have used the permalinks. So that's what have caused that problem. A couple other weird things that I've um, noticed, though. They've actually got two canonical tags in the site. They're the same, but they've got two tags. Um, they've also got two sets of Google Analytics running. Um, a really old set, that's the synchronous version, um, and a new version coming out of all-in-one SEO pack, which is the async version. Um, they are using the same profile ID, but it does mean that Google Analytics is going to fire twice. Um, it also means that the cookie data that Google Analytics is reporting is going to get written twice, which could cause all sorts of strange behaviors, and it is going to misreport the traffic profile for their site. Um, and then in the responses from the community, Tony um, McCreeth put in a whole bunch of other things that he found to do with, for instance, if you don't include a trailing slash, it redirects off to um, darlingtons.consciousblogs.com co.uk slash blah with the permalink. So they should implement um, say, mod rewrite rules to force always to go to their domain. They should fix the trailing slash issue. Um, they've got 404 error issues um, in terms of the fact that the 404 handler fires, but there's it redirects then to a page that responds with 200s. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that Tony dug up while he was doing more investigation into the issue, but I think they should address those for sure. But the root cause of the, the numbers was more than likely, the fact that they didn't used to have canonical tags. And it will probably address itself in due course.
Okay, so we're right to move on? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to find my place now. Ah, Mike uh, uh, Fisher Kirshner asked um, this question. Uh, he prefaced it with, uh, "Here's one that I think is interesting. Uh, do you often see people noting the SEO industry as scummy, more than even knowing what SEO is?" Uh, and it uh, linked to a post uh, uh, headed, "I'm quitting the SEO industry." We have worse reputations than used car salesmen, and there's no one to blame but us. Um, Just to be clear, Michael. that's the person, not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who wants to cover this? Oh, I'm, I'm caught the end of this. Uh, are we on about SEO rep? Yeah, SEO reputation, yeah. Yeah, th there's several contributing factors. Um, first is there is a percentage of SEOs that are scum. Um, they can't do the job, they lie, they misrepresent, they take people's money, then they go to places like Google Webmaster Forums and ask for free help. There they are charging their clients at $25 an hour and going to the regulars and TCs asking them how to do what they've just charged for. The other part of the problem is, is the SEO community itself hasn't kicked the scum to the curb. You cannot sit there and complain that your industry is being tarnished while you are sat on your hands doing nothing to defend it. You should have stood up and pointed the finger when you had the chance. Instead, they sat back and let their name get ruined, then whinged about it afterwards. I wouldn't say the name is ruined, just maybe not as look, kindly looked upon in some uh, in some area, let's say some industry areas or, or depending on kind of what people do. I don't know. Over the last couple of years, when I hear people hear the term SEO, I've had a small percentage of them kind of suck their teeth and go, ooh, isn't that dodgy? That's how bad it's got. People without a clue about what it really entails have become convinced that SEO can be bad for you. <sighs> That's not good. Well, you're, yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on, you know, to be fair, the type of person you're talking to. Um, and it's hard to, you know, make a, a judge, judgment call on that. And I, even myself, I'm, I'm going to be biased because of where I live and people have a general better understanding of kind of the online marketing world or anything online. So, yeah, that's why I threw it out there because, I mean, I don't know how it looks in different parts of the world that might not be as familiar. Uh, I, I, I must there. admit, um, <clears throat> when, I, when I speak to a, a, a new client or, or anyone, um, I invariably end up having to educate a lot more um, than I ever would have done in the past in the sense of um, people, you know, I would have to almost go on the, uh, the, the back foot about what SEO is in the sense of um, how it works ethically. Um, they know they they know they want to look at SEO, but they've either been burnt in the past or they've had um, some bad experiences, so you've got to sit down and discuss ethical SEO with them, rather than actually in a broad, you know, just talking about uh, what SEO encompasses in in, in that sense. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I think you know people that have have, have had bad experiences are um, you know are on the back foot. And uh, I suppose it has built up a bit of a cowboy reputation in the past. It's definitely that case. But to be clear, one of the joys I've had on G Plus is actually meeting SEOs that can do it, that aren't scum, that aren't sharks. 
I'm actually quite shocked by it because a couple of years ago, I thought 90% of the SEO industry were absolute a-holes. Um, I've now come to the conclusion it's only 50%. The problem is, is you can't readily identify them because everyone talks to talk. It's only when you go to walk the walk that you can tell they haven't got a clue. <laughs> I think there's also an, a side point, a, a, another area for this, which is that there are many SEOs you can say that are that are outdated, providing outdated recommendations. Um, that what will happen oftentimes is something that used to be good or okay or not necessarily considered to be bad has now shifted into a territory that if you do this you will get penalized and so you have clients that get burned from antiquated kind of recommendations um, and and there's there's not as strong of an understanding that things change over time so what used to work now doesn't um, and that's then seen as kind of bad SEO or scummy SEO when it's it's just more of these people haven't have given you bad information now or they haven't updated their their abilities or their skill sets um, and because of SEO as an as as kind of a tactic or strategies needs to consistently stay updated and change um, when a lot of people don't that kind of harms the industry's reputation too yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I've I've just posted in the link here something that Lyndon um, shared yesterday. Uh, basically, that is okay. The guy called himself online marketing, <laughs> um, so let's call it SEO in the, in in that sense. But this guy has just basically copied someone else's SEO article <laughs> from like two thousand and five, pretty much used it on his blog purporting to understand SEO um, and I mean he just got the most basic errors wrong there firstly he's plagiarized which is just completely wrong but I mean he copied and pasted this uh, in that sense and then and then also I mean he didn't even change the spelling to suit because he's a .co.uk you know to suit English you know UK I mean it's so yeah, you have cowboys out there which just go and you know kill things in in that sense. Is that the one I posted yesterday? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't remember his name. Um, did we share it in here as well? Or I've just shared your link. Yeah. What was his name? Because I think the public should be made aware. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's entirely up to you, Lyndon. Oh, definitely, sir. Definitely. His name is. Is come on, where is it? Where is it? I've posted the link. Yeah, John McAvey. <laughs> McAvey. McVee. 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 Um, and it's from Search Engine Optimization Tips, and it's one two one. MCV sales marketing dot dot com. If you really fancy a laugh and see the type of SEO that you should be avoiding like the plague, go read that site. Ship it down in stone, pin it to your wall and go, I will not be that stupid. You don't blatantly copy someone's content. If you do happen to paraphrase or quote some of their content, you damn well one give attribution, two correct the spellings and typos, three verify the content because there are no alt tags, it's an alt attribute, four try to find out how old it is because that thing must be what eight years old? That's how out of date it is, things have changed a wee bit since then, and five do whatever you can to not look like a complete hit. Unlike John McVeigh of Search Engine Optimization Tips on 121 MB, MCV Sales Marketing .blogspot .com. Um, 
Yes, well, um, I mean, I, I'm surprised, Lyndon, because he's a fellow blog spotter. Don't make me. <laughs> Don't make me. Uh, well, anyway. Um, uh, you want to move on? Okay, I, I have, yep. yep. I, I have something to add, but, you know, we can move on. All right. If you want. Okay. Uh, um, Micah asked another one, and uh, um, it's probably deeper. This, this, this might uh, take our whole four hours. More hypothetical than useful, but I often like to ask these things. What are the implications in the future as Google moves from innocent until proven guilty to guilty until proven in innocent? I think we kind of covered that a little bit earlier when we talked uh, a little bit on, along the lines of the, the, the paid lead topics, but I don't know if anybody wants to jump further into that. I think we're seeing that today with, with Penguin. I, I think pretty much there was a determination through an algorithm that you're, you're, you're guilty and you're penalized. And I think we're seeing that exactly what what us what we all have, or dare I say, in the SEO community to uh, correct. Um, we're seeing that today. So the results are not pretty. I don't like them, but what are you going to do? Makes I've it harder. Thinking, uh, I've been thinking. Uh, I mean. It, it, <laughs> The thing about negative SEO um, is that um, somebody else is doing it. Google's got no way of knowing that whether somebody else is doing it or you're you're doing it, but they have, um, that, you know, that, that they identify through the relationship that your site has with other sites. They identify a, a significant percentage uh, that um, approach a, a, an upper level le level uh, parameter like a, a threshold. And uh, so, therefore, they say, "Look, this site is gone, and you know, just won't rank anymore." They push it down about, I don't know, fifty places. Um, the, the 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 thing is that um, if it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, we're on the receiving end of, of, of treatment like that um, for negative SEO, and have been for years. Um, and, and it is frustrating when when, when there's no um, means of um, correcting it. Um, I mean, no doubt Google has decided that there are so few sites that are getting affected by it that, um, uh, that, that you know there are so few sites uh, affected by it that that we'll just let those sites suffer and. Um, that's that. Yeah, but so we'll... I've, I've got a pl I've got a plan. I've got a plan. Um, what, what I intend to do is encourage negative SEO so that every site on the internet is hit by negative SEO. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so guys, if you if you're out there, um, you know, as as you know, we discussed uh, paid li paid links. Um, the, 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 look up on YouTube, man in the middle attack. They're, they're really good. <laughs> It passed. I won't say anymore. I, I, I just, you know, what's an acceptable level of people getting hurt? What's what, what's the acceptable number of collateral damage? Or let's go with percentage. What's an acceptable percentage? So, you know, Tim had something that he has a client that that was doing something that she had been doing for fifteen years. The same thing over and over and over again and it worked for her so she was learning how to do it by getting good rankings and then all of a sudden the algorithm changed and she had absolutely no idea what was going on and that's what I'm finding you know in, in my in my line of work I get I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of different SEO companies and and they and they are, I think, they are a little bit behind on exactly what 
should and shouldn't be done. And they're a little bit confused. Even in the SEO community, they're, they're confused with the updates and the difference between a manual and an algorithmic penalty. But I think that's what it boils down to is, is what is an acceptable amount of collateral damage and can Google do better? And if you feel like Google could do better, then you're on one side of the fence than somebody who feels like Google is doing as best they can. So I think it's from your perspective and who you talk to and who you deal with is how you feel about the job that Google's doing. And I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that you know the the, the I mean we're, we're talking about Google uh, where um, they, these are people that um, aren't webmasters. Um, well, no, I'm, I'm, that, that sounds critical, but they're, they're, they're not. Um, they're, they're, they're living in a vacuum, if you like, um, and, and 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 doing great things. And, and um, the the, um, the 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 theory of infallibility. Um, you know, I mean. Uh, Ahmed Single, I, I watched him, uh, and he said, "We are Google," you know, it's, uh, as, as if that means that, that, that they can do no wrong. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. actually, I've lost my train of thought. Somebody else, I, I've got, I've well, got a point to make. I'm just going to remember. Well, I, I think what the 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 the, the, the pro. Uh, for, for me, and I think a lot of other people, and I, I'm not going to speak for everybody else, but I think, I think where people have an issue is is, is not necessarily that you get an algorithm penalty or adjustment um, or manual if you're doing some bad things. Okay, so you probably need to be to be have your rankings adjust adjusted. What 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 I think is is goes against um, fair play is not giving somebody the opportunity to fix their mistakes and to correct themselves. So in the in the real world, if you're if you make a mistake, you're brought against the judge, you can plead your case, and they can find you guilty and they can put you in jail for X amount of time and then you get out. And I think that people are are under the impression that you're getting a life sentence for something that deserves a little slap on the wrist. And other people are getting a little slap on the wrist to deserve a life sentence. So the the whole judgment system behind everything is is what I think some people are questioning: is is it really fair and is it transparent? And and those are the questions. It, you know, how are you making these judgments and and how are you affecting these businesses? And if somebody does get a bunch of negative SEO thrown onto them, and they do get a an actual algorithm adjustment and they do drop in ranking what is the what how do you get out of that how do you correct that because a reconsideration request isn't going to work um, there's a lot of questioning uh, questions out there whether the disavow tool works so uh, I, I think there's a lot of questions and it almost seems like we're dealing with the the question of guilty until proven innocent right now and what the ramifications are with that. So you could have a very yeah. good site and, and get killed and not be able to come back. Well, Al Alistair's looking after a, a gentleman. I looked at, looked at a site the other, the other day uh, that uh, Alistair pointed out to me, and, and this guy, uh, um, one of the um, pioneers of the web, uh, running a blameless site. Um, I hope I'm still right in, that, in saying that, Alistair, but. Uh, He's running a you know a good site uh, and uh, it's just fallen out of out of the sky. But uh, look, I, I before I, I probably sounded like I, I thought that Google didn't care. I I, I don't doubt that they care, um, and 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 I don't doubt that every time somebody uh, proposes some algorithmic enhancement, that um, you know the first question someone at, at the meeting will ask is. You know um, how much collateral damage will there be? Um, don't doubt that for a second. I'm sure they care at, at at a level, but I think the problem is that accepting any collateral damage is wrong. I mean, I think they um, 
veered off the path of, of, of righteousness um, some time ago when they started ex accepting collateral, da collateral damage. Why, you know, I mean, if, if it has to be that somebody innocent has to suffer because of their actions, they shouldn't do it. End of story. So I, I don't think a percentage is, is no matter how small, I, I don't think it's flip right. That it's just not moral. Pardon? Flip, flip, flip that around and say, um, what, why should someone undeserving um, win? Yeah, but that, I mean, th this is why uh, um, we have, um, when people go to court, um, uh, guilty people go free um, just to ensure that uh, innocent people uh, aren't um, um, you know, locked up. And even then, we still get innocent people being locked up. Yeah, but that depends on your, your the justice system. Certain countries have it slightly modified, where it's guilty until proven innocent, and if you can't right. prove your innocence, you're guilty. The, the bigger issue here, I think, just in general, is uh, we've covered this before briefly. Is that um, no one, I think, agrees that anyone should tolerate um, collateral damage, right? Everyone thinks that the world should be a perfect place. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, on Google's side of the fence, they're trying to write um, a system that control, you know, close to a billion different websites. They're pulling down 20 plus billion documents a day, trying to crawl the web at an ever increasing pace. Um, and, you know, I think sitting back on a, on a moral high ground, saying you, you can't do anything if all um, billion websites are unaffected is completely unrealistic because otherwise Google's product would make no ground. They, they, their, their product is forged around the logic that they're trying to surface the best quality results. If a website falls foul of their algorithms, even though they've done no wrong necessarily, but simply that it doesn't meet some aspect of their um, algorithm, Google's goal is to return the highest quality search result for any given query. Now, the likelihood is that virtually every single query in the world is going to return um, 10 pages, 50 pages, 50 million pages of people that are competing in some way for that phrase. Um, if you're not good enough to meet a quality guideline of some persuasion inside the algorithm and you, through no action of your own, just simply that, Google has changed their algorithms and they no longer deem your site to be a high enough quality site and it, and it falls in the rankings. They're doing that because they're saying, um, we've got a better website that we feel is a higher quality that will produce higher user outcomes um, for our customer. And their goal is all about delivering highest quality results to users. It's not about satisfying the whims of, of mum and dad on the corners, bottle shop that suddenly lost rankings. It's about making sure that for any query, they're trying to return the best results. Does that mean that some people win and some people lose? You bet. But they're fiercely driven by trying to make it better. I know we would criticise them and burn them to the ground when they make changes to the algorithms and you know, they don't work in our favour or we think we can pick holes in the algorithm when certain queries return, you know, like domain crowding issues, for instance, or whatever. But, you know, th these are isolated scenarios for us versus a trillion queries that happen a day or whatever the hell it is, a billion queries a day that happen on Google. You know, we're, we're picking holes in particular ones. The broadest cross-section of queries from Google don't exhibit these kind of behaviours or that people would be you know, there'd be a lot more noise. For the average person, the quality of the results are very, very good. And you can see that because guess what? Google owns the market virtually globally in every country because they're outpacing every other search engine in virtually every other language around the world. If Yandex or Baidu or Naver or Bing or any other search engine on the planet could outpace Google, I would change tomorrow. I wouldn't care. But guess what? They can't. You know, there's there's a handful of search engines in small markets around the world that are outpacing them for quality, like Yandex in Russia, or Beidou in China, or Naver in 
um, Taiwan or wherever a neighbor's based or whatever. I think you know the, the expectation that they're going to never hurt someone indirectly through a change when their goal is to provide a better quality. The net result of that is have a better website. This is no different than um, a normal business letting their shop front run down and not keeping the upkeep on it, right? People walk along the street and there's, there's three ice cream parlors in the street. Two of the ice cream parlors are always ship shape, beautiful, clean, and they present immaculately. One of them still sells the same ice cream, but their shop front doesn't look as good anymore. The people will just naturally gravitate towards the one that's better. And but, guess what? It's the, it's the fault of the store owner that's let the shop front run down. Let me ask a question on that. If, if you have three ice cream parlors on a street, I own one and you own one, and at night I go over to yours and I just, you know, put something like this ice cream is dirty all over the wind windows of your ice cream shop. If I say you, know, you used uh, uh, spoiled milk for your ice cream and, you know, I just graffiti your whole your whole storefront, um, you, you know, nobody's going to go into your store. End of story. That's where the story ends with Google. You're you're going to get. But that's not the scenario we're talking about here. We're talking about the scenario where Google makes changes to an algorithm and there's collateral well, damage. Someone graffitiing a store. Well, I, I, I think you're going to have collateral damage. You, you know, it would be nice that if you could make a change in the algorithm and, and not have any. That is. Uh, so we're not talking about actually you know websites losing ranking. We're talking about somebody who really doesn't deserve to lose ranking. Because of an algorithm change. But yeah, but but you know, on the other hand, if you took Google into context of the real world, <laughs> um, we we there is a resource for the law, in in that sense. Um, I know I can't drive my vehicle without road tax because there is a law. It's out there. It's published. Um, I know when, um, if I'm a catering industry, I know what it, rules and regulations I have to follow in order for um, me to pass these specific, um, you know, requirements uh, set by the industry. Google does not tell you what the rules and regulations are. Well, well they do. They, they do it they, in, they, in they, a sense. Like you're not allowed to buy what, links. Right, you're not allowed to buy links, correct? So if you buy a link and you get caught buying a link, you're going to get hurt by you know Google's going to punish you. the The problem is, is in the the road tax thing is if you don't pay your road tax, you get a you get a fine. But what if you pay your road tax? You're doing the right thing. And the equivalent is is somebody coming along. Well, to put it put it a little bit differently, if if I was able, if you're not allowed to park in a handicap zone, and I was able to, when you, I was able to get in your car and park your car in a handicap zone, then, and you got a ticket, well, the judge doesn't care whether you parked it in a handicap zone or I parked it in a handicap zone. The car is in the handicap zone, you, you know, and it's, it's registered to you. So, from that aspect of it, Google looking at it, it's like, okay, well, it's your website. If somebody else did something that is against our guidelines and hit your website, it's really not Google's responsibility to figure it out. It's somebody else's. And we're, we're a lot a lot of the, the reason why this discussion comes up is because of the negative SEO aspect of it. Just like with the three ice cream stores on a street, if one of them gets pummeled with graffiti, then that's against the law, right? So if they catch whoever does that, they're going to get in trouble and they're going to go to jail. Or they're going to fine for, you know, graffiti. But the store owner should be able to clean his own store up, right? He should be able to say, okay, you know, here we're going to, we're going to clean this all up and we're going to make the storefront acceptable again. What people, the way I see it, and I could be completely wrong, is there some 
some aspect of what Google's doing is, is it's very difficult for you to clean up that storefront. Now, if you're a store owner, you're not asking for anything from the general public or from Google or anybody else. What you're asking for is just the ability to say, I'm clean. And I want to start, I want to start with a clean, fresh, new storefront. And I suppose you could ultimately by saying, I'm just going to throw this whole domain and whole website out the window and start all over again. So they would, you know, instead of cleaning your graffiti off your storefront, you're just going to move across the street, build a new store and open up a new one. I, I think there's some confusion. Um, I 100% agree with Alistair that there's going to be, there's, there's going to be some people who get hurt that, yeah, it probably doesn't need to get hurt. Probably shouldn't have gotten hurt. However, those are outliers and Google's willing to accept that. But take it one step further. How do we how how do we deal with somebody, or how does Google deal with somebody that has been uh, has been affected with collateral damage? So somebody gets hurt. It is collateral damage. It's not. It's it was a mis, it was just one of those things that I got caught up in um, or on the borderline, whatever. How do we how does that website come back? And that's where. Um, with the, the kind of circle of, well, if I disavow links um, and, but Google, we're not sure if Google's actually using a disavow for the algorithm adjustment that they've done. And, and, it, and it's like, there's no clear cut way of getting out of that. So you can't get, you can't go to the judge, can't get penalized, you can't do your time, do your community service and get back into society like everybody else. You literally have to change your name and start all over again. I think that's where a lot of people are having an issue. Or am I completely off base with this? <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss the? Am I completely missing something here, or should I? Is it is it really wrong to think that way? I mean, Alistair. No, no, it's 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 not that. Um, uh, Robert's just said your mic's been muted for the last ten minutes. All right. <laughs> I must have been typing and it muted it. So, no, I mean, I, I mean, am I am I wrong in that, Alistair? I mean, should there not be some way to get out of that for somebody who is collateral damage? Shouldn't there, there be should. some? Absolutely, and, and and you know we've touched on this in previous hangouts where we've talked about there not being um, mechanisms to even understand well enough why you're penalized, for instance, or um, what might have happened to ultimately bring a penalty against you. So the example from that Jim gave earlier, I ordered at a website, a music website, um, a week ago, and it's been on the internet since 1996. And this guy sells royalty-free music. Um, and it's a nice little website, and it's been updated periodically across that time. Um, all original work, um, but as of sort of um, a year and a half ago, it's just been going downhill. And you know, he, the guy that owns the site is an older bloke. He's never promoted it. It just exists, and it used to do really well. And now, you know, he's doing a quarter of the business that he used to do. He's collateral damage. He's done nothing wrong. He's he's never hired an SEO. He's never done anything weird. His business has simply fallen out of favor with the Google algorithms over time. And he deserves, in my opinion, he completely deserves to be told in some way that his site is not optimal in some form. But for him, you know, he's not an SEO. He logs into Webmaster Tools, doesn't say anything. He's never received any notifications from Google that say, um, you know, you're doing something wrong, or we've noticed unnatural links to your website, or you know, you've got really bizarre crawl errors through your website, or you've got huge numbers of 404s, or duplicate titles, tags, descriptions, no tags, you know, all of these kinds of things. He doesn't have it. For all practical purposes, his website's in pretty good nick. Um, 
in, in you know, general terms, but he has fallen out of favour with the algorithms and he deserves to be able to get out of that completely, 100%. But for him, um, he, he has no capacity to understand why he's been penalised. Zero. Completely so would, not trans. Would that be a legitimate... Uh, would that be? Would it be? I, I mean, think of it this way: Google. I mean, in the search engines in general. Is there any other business out there that would uh, not give information to people in order for them to help them correct it, whatever issue they have? Is there any other business out there that would do that? Is there any government agency other than tyrannical governments? That would do that, and and if that was the case, if there are, I mean, isn't I, I think the public would be and have some outrage against that. But that's that's I guess I, I guess it's nothing. There's nothing wrong with saying to somebody that you have you know this weird indexing issue or four hundred fours or duplicate titles. I don't think there's anything wrong with telling people that, and. And it's not giving away the secret sauce. It really isn't. And I, that's what I don't understand. Now, on one side note on is, do, does Google even know? You know, if you're getting an algorithm penalty and you don't know what's happening and there's nobody to call on the other end and say, hey, I've, I've been losing ranking and I don't know what's happening. Um, there's nothing there. There's no there there. I mean, if you start losing ranking because of an algorithm penalty, you're, you're, there's nobody to call. No, um, look, I'm sure that inside um, Google, they've got all sorts of very slick tools that, that you could, for instance, if John Mueller pointed their tools at um, arbitrary website X, I am 100% confident that they would have all sorts of cool things that would show Tremendous amounts of data, historic data about the site, and oh. things that are covering during crawls, and how different aspects of their algorithms are are or aren't affecting the website in some persuasion. That they'll have. But it, you're right? not going to give. You're not. You can't give those. Though, you can't give those can't, tools to everybody. No, no. But you can't give. You can't give that level of detail to an average webmaster, right? But let's right. just say this. You could come up to this. To the guy that owns this music website, and Google could easily have come up to him with a webmaster notice, and could have come up and said, um, "We've noticed an unusually large number of indexed documents on your website." Um, that's yeah. Just to say, right? Right. That's, that's got. If if you know you've got a really big website, let's say you're Amazon, and they come back and say, "Well, we've found." 40 million pages indexed, we think that's a really big number. If you're Amazon, you might say that's completely fine. Um, we've got 30 million products in our website and we've got various ways to navigate to it. That's okay. If you've got you know, 500 pages of content, and most webmasters know how many pages to some degree their website might have. If it comes back and says, we've noticed an unusually number, high number of things indexed, that, that alone might make a webmaster come up and go, well, I know I, I, my e-commerce store only sells 300 products. How the hell does Google have 20,000 things indexed? Well, didn't they have that in the webmaster tools? That's a little weird. Didn't they, they do. They've, they got, they've, got a, they've got a number of indexed um, in, in the crawl report stuff, but it doesn't come up as an alert. It just tells you that yeah. it's there, right? So let's just say one of the things that this music website's penalised with is, or being affected by, is um, thin content, or duplicate content, or lots and lots of indexed content. You know, thousands and thousands of unneeded pages that are indexed. There's got to be ways for Google to um, provide some some more level of insight to an average person that they can comprehend without talking about Penguin. No bloody website owner knows what the hell that is. They don't know what toxic links are or... It, no, anyone outside of the search industry couldn't give a damn about that. They just want to run their business. 
So you know they need to find ways to send notifications to the the 20 million people, 50 million people that have got their websites valid, uh, verified in Webmaster Tools. They need to find a way to send you know logical messages to webmasters when they think that there might be something going on. It doesn't mean that it's wrong and that you're necessarily being penalised. But it's at least like a hey, an FYI. We think this could be something a bit funky going on. Just like when they send out the notifications 12 months ago, 18 months ago, saying we've we think there's some weird links to your site. This is just a notification. You haven't been penalised, but we found some weird things. You might want to look into it. Well, you know they could find ways to report different aspects of the algorithm in a similar kind of a way. That's Helpfully vague, you know, to at least help a webmaster start, you know, prodding and asking questions about something, as opposed to just doing nothing. Because in the case of this music website, um, every as far as Webmaster Tools is concerned, it looks good. He's got no duplicate titles, no missing titles, no short titles, no missing descriptions, no duplicate descriptions. Very few 404 errors, very few crawl errors. He's got no robot issues, server timeouts, DNS issues. Um, it was like a, basically a clean bill of health through Webmaster Tools. I crawled his site with um, Xenu and Screaming Frog and IIS SEO Toolkit. All came back pretty clean. You know, like for all practical purposes, it looked pretty good at a, at a quick glance. But there's clearly something with this site that's wrong, and here's a perfect example of collateral damage, where he deserves some amount of help to try and get out of it. But there's there's not even an inkling of assistance inside Webmaster Tools for those kinds of scenarios to try and help a webmaster get out of that. He he just makes 25% less money on his royalty for music. You know, and this guy's not like a, a fly-by-nighter. He's been doing this. This is his life. He's a musician. He's a composer. You know, he's a concert pianist or a violinist type of a person. You know, he's a professional musician. And so he's not he's not dodgy, but he's been penalised. So I completely agree. That they they webmasters deserve an out when things go wrong. Um. But there's there's just not enough tooling around webmaster tools to um, even begin to help um, in these sort of scenarios. <clears throat> so did you see the? Uh, and I'm trying to find a link, but somebody uh, I, it was going around where somebody from Google um, was trying was um, using somebody's website that had an article. Um, I can't remember what the article was about, but they were using it to quote. From the article, and the website had been the server had been hacked, and uh, a bunch of Viagra, Cialis, or whatever content was added to that website. But the only people who could see it was the people searching from a Google IP address. <laughs> so here's a site that is. You know, normally when you go to the site, and I, I looked into this and, and played around with it for a while, and I went to the site, couldn't see anything in the code, nothing, it was completely clean. Went back and looked at cache, and the cache version of it, um, and lo and behold, there it was. And what's really kind of disturbing is the, web, the website owner... Um, whether the website owner even cares or not, it was an old, older article. Um, but what if you're just the average person going along, plugging along, and something happens and in, in, in your site gets hacked? And some, not mal malicious code, not malware, but just regular content with some backlinks pointing to some questionable sites, and you end up getting an adjustment from that. And it it happened to me on in, in, you know, a couple years ago. I had somebody that got a password somehow to one of my sites and injected a bunch of crap um, with a bunch of links pointing to somebody that was selling nail polish. 
of all things. And they put a bunch of content on my site. And there was no way for me to see it. It didn't matter. It, it, wasn't, it was nowhere that I could find. Um, but it, unfortunately, um, some websites aren't going to pick that up. So they could end up getting a penalty. Now, Google knows about this, let's say. Google sees this from their IP. You have somebody who does a manual review. They see it. And they you know, give a penalty and not direct somebody to say, look, you know, you've been hacked. There's no mechanism for that. There's no way to get around that. Unless you happen to have a Google, a Googler, find your site or likes your site, wants to quote your site, sees some, some, uh, some malicious stuff being done to it, and calls you out on it in a, in a public forum like Google+. That doesn't happen for normal people. So, you know, the lesson there is, is to have is security in place and to change your passwords and everything. But you know what? This is the internet. Stuff happens. And but this is another perfect. example where they could be um, more transparent, right? So right, right. Google, publish, Google publish guidelines. The guidelines are for everyone to see, and they've got quality guidelines and technical guidelines. Um, they, they could easily produce webmaster messages um, that talk to an average person in language that they understand that directly line up with each of the quality and technical guidelines. They could do that easily. For instance, they could come up and say, we've detected that you're cloaking. Whether you think you are, in, it doesn't matter if it's deliberate, we think you're cloaking. Here's an example of this page that's different to a user and different to Googlebot, right? That doesn't harm anyone. It's not secret source. And if it's if it's completely unintended from the webmaster's side of the fence, because a, a software developer has done something a little bit weird, unbeknownst to them, they've cloaked, that, that's not hurting anyone, right? Google's guideline says, um, be, be careful who you link to, because it's a reputation control metric, right? Google know when you link to people that uh, is um, uncharacteristic of your type of website in your country, in your vertical, in your town. They know what a link profile looks like from an average business of type X. They do because there's a hundred million of them and they can statistically know what normal looks like, right? They could easily come up and produce a thing that says, um, we think that you're linking to um, some questionable websites from your site. You should review them um, and, and talk to the webmaster in plain language that says, um, we care who you link to because it's a, it, it's a reflection on your business or your business's reputation. You should check who you link to from your website. That's not giving away secret source. You know, so if you were to go through all of the, the quality and technical guidelines, you could genuinely help a lot of webmasters just by doing a great job of helping them understand those components in simple, easy to understand language that's not giving away secret source. Um, you know, uh, it's much harder for them to come up and be transparent about things that they deliberately don't want to be transparent about. Um, you know, like they don't want to be completely transparent about link profiles, as an example. So that's a little harder for them to come up and say, well, we've, we've noticed unnatural links to your website. So imagine your, um, imagine your Interflora and there's a webmaster message comes up and says, hey, we've just noticed a whole bunch of links from news websites that are effectively advertorials, right? That's never gonna show up inside webmaster tools because a news website um, like the Daily Telegraph or something like that in the UK, could link to bloody anyone every day of the week. There's no link or website that's effectively out of bounds for that. But so you can see how those kinds of scenarios are much more difficult for them to transparently report on. But I think there's a long, a, a, a good distance that they could move forward in helping an average person understand why the hell they're penalised. Or, or even if it's not that they're penalized, 
in quotes, but why their website might not be meeting quality or technical guidelines, which is inadvertently algorithmically adjusting their site down. That's that that's that's what it is, is is it's not necessarily a penalty, it's just algorithmically adjusting the site down. But there could be some issues there that you're unaware of. Um, yeah, it's a tough job. I mean, I, I, I see Google's point of view on a lot of these things. It's, 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 you can't accommodate everybody. But on the other hand, you should be able to give a pathway to um, getting some answers. And it could be because of they don't have the, the en enough of people there in that particular uh, team. It could be any a number of reasons, but I think that the impression that we all get, or at least I get, is that it's there's if you get caught into a cer certain uh, matrix that you may never get out. And and why should I why should I put all this effort into something that possibly could get caught into that matrix? And it could it could be caused by something that I haven't done that somebody's has done to me, negative SEO. That's what's scary is is to a certain degree and what causes fear, uncertainty, and doubt in webmasters. And actually uh, actually people who read a little bit, uh, that's where the problem lies. Is you have somebody who owns a website that reads a little bit, not a lot, but reads a little bit about SEO and, and what's going on with the industry. And then the next thing you know, they're like, well, um, if I get if I do X, Y, and Z, my website's going to be destroyed, and there's no way to get out of it. So I, I don't know. I, I I think you have to have um, you have to have a way to get out. And if you don't, um, it, it causes the, the fud, and and I don't think that's fair either. There's also the, the issue that like nothing is ever black and white. But, uh, somebody may very well be, say for argument's sake, hit by negative SEO, um, and so and they, and they can see it happening. They're, they're, uh, and and uh, I mean, take our case. Um, we're definitely hit by a negative SEO, but um, you know um, that may not be all of our problems. You know, like there may be algorithmic issues. Um, um, that uh, are quite legitimate, and uh, um, you know we're, we're losing traffic more from them than from the negative SEO. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, lost my train of thought again. We yeah, better move on. <laughs> yeah, okay. we'll be talking about this forever. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Uh, our next uh, question uh, is from Nikhil Gabda, who asks. Does anyone think that keyword density and proximity still matters in content? I don't think so, Nikhil. No. no. Um, if yes, uh, then how much would the percentage be? Um, adding one more question. Um, marking keywords in bold or italic, does this still hold importance in the content? Uh, in other words, does Google, Googlebot um, value a word in bold or italic? Um, more than an adjacent word that is um, not in bold or italic. If he'd left it at just keyword density, the answer would have been simple and straightforward, no. It doesn't matter if you've got the keyword in there once out of 100 words or 50 times out of 100 words, you're not really going to rank higher for it. Um, Google really doesn't work that simplistically anymore, hasn't done for years. The mention of proximity, though, makes it more complicated because you start looking more towards language in topical models, latent semantic indexing, um, LDA, which Google does use. Doesn't use LSI, doesn't apparently use LDA, but they must have their own language vector model where they can look at a page, take the word words apart, look at how many are present, which ones seem to relate, to figure out what the page is on about. Um, proximity plays a part in that. 
Then you've got the semantic influence. Yes, strong, bold, emphasized, italic. Google does wait then. Same as link text. People keep forgetting that link text on a page may impact that page's relevancy score. It's not just the destination of that link. So if you've got a page linking out to a site about rabbits, and your page is on about cars, and your link text says rabbits, Google's going to raise its eyebrows. Um, it's not as straightforward as some people seem to make out. But Google has not relied on pure keyword density for years. You know, I don't understand why the SEO community is still banging on about it. Uh, I don't understand that either. I, I think you, you made some good points there. I, I think, um, however, I think if you're trying to figure it, that out, um, you're banging your head against the wall. I think if you write really good content and it's within your subject matter and you're using words within the subject matter, then you're going to be, you should be fine. I, I really wouldn't worry about keyword density. If you start looking at proximity and related terms and, and LSI and you start trying to figure that out, uh, you, you're really getting to something that you can't figure it out because it's an algorithm, it's, it's a machine that's, that's looking at unstructured documents in such a way that can figure out relevancy. I think that's that almost a waste of time. And even if you did all that, it's not going to do any good if the content isn't readable, doesn't make sense, and isn't within your market space, and you're not going to get any links. Nobody's going to link to content that is, is, was written for keyword density. So and out to the engines because just by making something bold is not going to make it rank better. What's going to make it rank better is this really good content and you can, you're going to get some links to it. Okay. All right, now look, um, guys, we're going to have to fire up. Um, we're getting um, um, fairly bogged down. We've, we've got a heap of questions to cover. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have more brief if we're going to get through them. Uh, can someone give me a 10 second answer to Volgan's uh, Kramer's question? What is your favorite e commerce open source CMS from an SEO perspective? Oh boy. Did I insult everybody they left? Hello. I I don't use e-commerce, so I can't answer the question. Okay. Um, well, um, there was a there was a problem. SEO, yeah. There, there was a problem uh, with Google Plus. Just to let you know. What was the problem? I don't know. It's some type of five hundred error. So if some people dropped off. It might not be because they want to drop off. Uh, I see. Okay, Alistair's back. Yep. I thought I'd insulted you, Alistair. <laughs> What's that? I said I thought I'd insulted you. No, no. <laughs> okay, Volgans, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that uh, question, but uh, what I will do is um, sometime through the week I'll ask around and I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll Give it uh, an answer uh, uh, next week. Scott Rosier asks a question about duplicate content. If I am the author and I have two websites, example, Bay Area Real Estate and San Francisco Real Estate, my San Francisco Real Estate website is exclusively about real estate in San Francisco, while Bay Area Real Estate 
is about real estate in several cities, including San Francisco. If the pages on my Bay Area real estate site are duplicate to the pages on my San Francisco website with regards to San Francisco, is there going to be a problem? I would make one great site. That would be my recommendation and not and not use duplicate content. So if you could you know make the content unique in some way, and that's what I would do. But I think you're splitting spl splitting the effort there between two sites and I would I would think that you could concentrate on one site and make it a really great site rather than having two. The other thing that you could yep, do I is, um, in question to the, pro the problem in terms of will it cause problems, um, probably it depends on to what scale Scott is going to duplicate that content. If it's, you know, some pages, okay. If it's lots and lots of pages, that might look a little weird. What he could do, though, if he, um, if he feels that there's a good reason to have all of the um, San Francisco um, property on the Bay Area website, or whichever way, it, I don't, whichever way that works in the U.S. in terms of what's which is the big area. Um, what he could do is include the content from the smaller area in the larger website, and then add canonical tags to it back to the smaller website. So users that come to the broader website in terms of the broader coverage area. Um, continue to be able to see the property listings for the smaller region, if need be. Um, but then he won't be penalised for having the content in two places because he's essentially syndicating it, which is perfectly normal. Um, or the other thing that he could do is no index the pages from the smaller website that are on the broader, bigger website. Um, that would also be perfectly fine from Google's side of the fence because they're not duplicated, they're not indexed in this scenario either. Um, but I completely agree with Rob. Um, unless Scott's got a really compelling reason to have two websites, I would say have one website and make it better, harder, faster, stronger, bigger, gnarlier. Um, particularly since they're so directly related. Okay. Slumamir Zudanek asks, hello everyone, uh, there are companies which can function locally and globally, uh, for example, SEO companies. If you put your address on the website, does Google confine you to this specific location and you limit, uh, and li limit your chances to rank globally? Thanks in advance for any comments. No. That, that's the simple answer, I think. Um, Google's, you know, take a um, take a global hotel chain like um, Hilton Hotels. Hilton have got hundreds, thousands of hotels listed on their website. Um, each of the hotels carries um, address information, for instance, for each of the hotels around the world. And if I go looking for a Hilton Hotel in some far reaches of the world from Australia, Hilton.com is going to show up, and that's perfectly fine. So it's not going to confine you. If, if your content is relevant um, to an audience, then it's going to show up. Um, the only time that that might be more difficult to do is if you're using a country code domain. Um, if, if you're using a country code domain or your website is geo-targeted to a country, um, that'll make that a little tiny bit more difficult because Google obviously places your content into either the region that your domain is associated to or that you've manually geo-targeted to. That doesn't mean that the content can't rank outside of, for instance, Australia. Um, if that was where you geo-targeted the content to. Um, but it will have a clear preference to show more in Australian search results or people that are in Australia, for instance, 
um, than, for instance, people that are in Uzbekistan or the US or France. But if someone that was in France was looking for content on an Australian domain because they're doing searches from France um, looking for a product on a, an Australian website, Google is going to return them the AU domain even though they're searching from Google FR. It'll just work. Cool. Okay. On with the next. Oh, this was one that uh, I posted. We can skip it if you like. Do, um, I'll do, I'll, um, I, no, I'll, I'll read it out. Um, does anybody object to me reading it out? Go your hardest. <laughs> okay, uh, I posted this because it, it, you know sometimes I get a rush of blood to the head and uh, just have to put put things down on paper. But um, I, I headed it, questions you should ask about the so-called Disavow Links tool. If Penguin, which targets and algorithmically uh, penalizes websites with spammy links, uh, if this has not been run since before the uh, Disavow Links tool w was released uh, last October, and an integral part of the negative SEO bag of tricks is, is the anti-competitive placement of spammy links linking to a competitor's website, how is disavowing links expected to help victims of uh, negative SEO? The next uh, question was, as Google is only now reporting that they have found that many people have been un uploading unprocessable data um, because the disavow tool accepts illegal characters which are impossible to use in domain names, why wasn't this discovered at some earlier time in the six months uh, following the release of the Disavow Links tool? You'd think that if um, they were using this data, it, it, the, 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 the thought that people were uploading bad data would have occurred to them uh, back then. And the third uh, question was, if there really was a sincere intention to use this data in the first place, um, wouldn't it have made sense to implement simple validation in, in the first step of the process? Um, if, if, if the data that they're seeking is domains, um, wouldn't it have been smart to just uh, not accept um, a, a domain which contains a, an illegal character? In other words, a character which, um, if that was placed in, into a domain string, would not be registrable. Anyway. That was my little rant that day. I don't know. I don't know why I say these things sometimes. But um, no comments. Well, we um, I think on the the third point, in terms of the validation front, um, Brian White talked about this at SMX Sydney very briefly, and. Um, he basically said that, um, yes, there's some bugs still with the disavow tool in terms of being able to upload strange, weird characters in it. You know, they're expecting to see a certain, you know, all of the, the valid characters that domains are allowed to carry, even Unicode style characters. But people are still submitting disavow files with characters that are outside the valid range. Um, he said that it's not common, but it does happen, and um, they're working on, you know, making improvements to Webmaster Tools to, you know, close the loop on those sorts of errors. Um, so I guess, you know, in due course, that'll probably get fixed. Um, how is this our link expected to help victims? I think that in terms of the first question, part of the problem in that instance is how is a website owner meant to know what a spammy link is to be able to disavow them? If you're an average website owner, there's nothing in Google's guidelines or nothing in Webmaster Tools or anything that would give an indication to you that a certain link is bad or lower quality or higher quality. For instance, you know, 
this would be a bad gauge, but Google don't, for instance, um, provide a the page rank of the page that's linking to you as an example inside Webmaster Tools as a really crude metric. Um, or they don't provide some sort of topical relevance of that link. For instance, they could provide a, um, you know, five green bars. You know, if it's got zero green bars lit up, it's a really irrelevant link or really low quality. Five green bars is either a really high strength website or really highly relevant, one of the two. You know, they don't provide any indicators anywhere about what a quality link is, at which point, yet again, this goes towards the fact that an average website owner that could be affected by um, either direct or indirect action of their own or someone else's against their website, they've got no path forward in terms of actually trying to rectify this um, and trying to help themselves. They've got no choice but to go to an SEO. Unfortunately, even as an SEO, Google don't provide tools to assess the quality of these things and it's left to an SEO to evaluate the links on their best judgment um, about what they feel is a quality link or irrelevant or whatever it might be to set about trying to get them removed or and or subsequently disavowed. So that, that's, that's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm. Um, yeah, uh, I'm. I'm not sort of referring to to manual penalties, though. I'm. I'm referring to the, the penguin algorithm, which targeted um, unnatural links. Yeah. Is that is that a let's go step by step? That, that's a fair comment, isn't it? Penguin targeted unnatural links. Yep. Okay. Penguin prior to the release of the disavow links tool. Now, if Penguin uh, targeted unnatural links and, uh, you know, um, some malicious person uh, um, pointed spammy links um, to a website um, and, and, and it was impacted um, and penalised uh, by Penguin, how is uh, the disavow tool going to work um, to exonerate um, the webmaster that's hit by negative SEO. How, how could it possibly work? If it ran before the release of the tool, um, the, 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 assume, I mean, the webmaster knows that the, the, these links that, that are there, it disavows the, the, the bad links. Um, how, does it, uh, how could it possibly work? If, it, if the tool hasn't, if, if the uh, Penguin algorithm hasn't run since before the release of the, release of the tool, how can um, the disavow links tool um, have any effect? So there's, there's two possible parts to that. Is in regards to the disavow tool, Google has said that um, once you submit a disavow file, Google, it, it doesn't take effect immediately. Um, and you need to wait for Google to basically crawl the web and pick up all of the websites that you're disavowing again to essentially um, drop the, the pages or domains from your link graph as they recrawl the web. They don't just simply you upload a file and it just zaps the links as part of out of your link graph instantly, which you know arguably maybe they could do, but that's not how they've chosen to implement it. Instead, they've chosen to you upload the file. When we next crawl the web and discover a link from spammy website A to your website, we will check that against the disavow, and if it's in the disavow, we'll neutralize the link. So this might be a measure for Google, for instance, to combat the fact that they don't want SEOs to be able to strategically nuke links um, using the disavow tool to try and understand where the edge point is of the algorithm in terms of quality, because it will take quite an amount of time for you to, uh, you know, zap a link and then wait for it to get disavowed and then potentially wait some more time for those changes to come live in the index in terms of, you know, maybe your rankings being restored or whatever it might be. So I think um, the other thing that we're not necessarily clear on is 
it, it might be that Google have said you need to wait um, wait for Google to crawl the web again to find those pages as an indirect way of saying the algorithms or the underlying data for Penguin is recomputed every period. It's an offline thing. It's not real time like um, Google's crawl is basically real time. The, the metrics for Penguin are, are computed offline like the Panda, Peng, Panda algorithm has been until recently. May, maybe them um, saying you need to wait for Google to crawl the web has got less to do with Google actually actually needing to recrawl the web and more to do with the fact that um, to, to give themselves time because they know themselves that the underlying data for Penguin doesn't get updated regularly. Because clearly um, there's things that you can do in Webmaster Tools that have a near immediate effect on the index if you want. So Google's clearly got the ability to make very rapid changes to the index when they need to, for whatever reason. I, I can't see why when they can do so many other things in, in practically real time or at the behest of a webmaster through webmaster tools that they couldn't theoretically um, process a disavow file instantly and simply zap the links in the link graph that are within the, the disavow file. I think they probably could do something like that. Um, more likely, I think there's other motivations behind them not wanting to allow that to happen as an instantaneous or near instantaneous action, I would think. Hmm. It's a vexed question. <laughs> Does anybody else have an opinion? No opinions on the most important subject on the World Wide Web. Okay. All right. Okay. The uh, what happened? The next, um, I don't know. What what happened, Rob? I just got kicked off and came back on. Huh. Okay. Mm. Never mind then. Must have been just me. And um, it looks like uh, Joe Taylor joined us, um, but I can't see him. Anyway, Techni a lot of technical issues tonight. Um, oh, that's me. Let me see. You're Joe Taylor? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Let's try this again. <laughs> okay. Um, look, the, the next question um, is another um, um, criticism, um, and it's uh, a post uh, from um, uh, Richard Hearn. Uh, he um, um, was referring to a, a Q&A that Matt Cutts did with Danny Sullivan on Search Engine Land and um, Matt um, gave um, Matt, uh, sorry, Richard gave Matt um, a, a score of 0 out of 10 um, it seems. He referred to it as the worst interview responses ever. Now probably they weren't the worst um, but and should I read them out, or, or, or should we discuss it, or should we pass? Read it out. Might as well. We'll, we'll be brief. Okay. Danny asked. Okay. Danny asked, "Why not people? Why not tell people exactly what's wrong with their site?" to the degree that you can do this, and especially when it involves some specific URLs when notices go out. Matt replied, we've significantly improved our webmaster messages over time and we'll continue to look at ways to make the messages more concrete and actionable. Well, I accept the, the second part, but not the first. Um, 
Any any comments? Okay, the next question, uh, um, Danny asked, if someone gets a notice, can they go back to Google via a reconsideration request and ask for more advice about what's wrong, especially to get something specific? That responded, uh, if someone gets a notice about web spam, that means that they have a manual web spam action. That's because... Uh, Penguin is, is, is an algorithmic penalty and it, it doesn't um, send out um, messages. If the message is unclear and the webmaster wants more advice, we recommend asking questions in our webmaster SEO forum. After the issue is, re is resolved, um, webmasters can file a reconsideration request. After a webmaster files a reconsideration request, we do provide information about how the request was processed. For example, if the request was granted or whether more work still needs to be done. We don't have the resources to be a one on one con to have a one on one conversation with every single webmaster. But we do reply to some reconsideration requests with more information and advice. I think you've got an opinion on that, haven't you, Tim? Anybody? Yeah, so I, I, the, the first question very briefly, I mean we just talked about this a second ago about the fact that um, when there's specific stuff happening Google aren't specific with the um, advice that they provide. You know, look at the Mozilla example for instance. You're never going to find one page out of 10 million pages. In fact, it would be hard to find one page out of a thousand pages. So you know, they're just not helping enough in that regard. And, you know, it's not like they need to um, give the uh, the internal workings of how things at Google work to be able to help a website owner legitimately fix something that's on their site. Um, as for point two, yeah. I can't even begin to describe how weak that is because <laughs> Google penalise you, they don't tell you why you've been penalised, then they tell you to go to a volunteer, voluntary community where the community members have got no access to Google tools to help webmasters actually diagnose what's wrong. So it's all speculation from the community about what might be wrong with your website Despite their best intentions, they could send a webmaster on a wild goose hunt um, looking for or addressing issues with their site, which are actually not the root cause of why they've been penalised. Um, them saying we don't have the resources is as a weak answer as we've significantly improved our webmaster messages over time. It, it's a bullshit answer. It's a non-answer because they can do more they are choosing not to do more. You know, if they want to be in a position where they rely on automated systems to service the internet through algorithms and self-servicing tools, then I feel they have an obligation to make the tools actually genuinely useful to a larger group of people. And at the moment, they're not useful. If you get hit by a penalty or an algorithmic action against your website for some reason, like Panda or Penguin, there's no help within webmaster tools that would lead a webmaster to have any practical knowledge about what might be wrong and what they might want to do to try and resolve those kinds of issues. It's just, it's just not adequate at any level. Totally agree. I know that when, when um, Google de-indexed us, um, um, we had no idea um, what had happened or what had gone wrong um, and um, I, I, I went to that um, the webmaster forum and uh, I eventually spent a year or two there but when I first arrived there I was absolutely shocked just completely shocked at, at the way that um, people were treated there uh, just totally 
blown out of my mind. I just couldn't believe it. Um, and, you know, it's a difficult for me because well, you know, I have already, some friends there. Yeah, I mean, but you've already demonstrated that right in the beginning of the day when we shared that link uh, to Webmaster Forums. Mm. And even now, you know, the, 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 the help there is non-existent in, in a lot of times or very derogatory towards the person that has been sent there for help. If, in my opinion, and, and this, you know, if I was ever considered to be helpful, I'm happy to be helpful. But if I was Google, I would remove um, or reprimand or remove TC badges from anyone that acted like they do in the Google Webmaster forum. The behaviour from most of the people in there, like um, like the article that you linked to this morning or that we've just discussed before, is not appropriate as far as I'm concerned. Either be helpful or don't say anything. I'm sure their mother would have told them when they were younger, say nice things or don't say anything at all. Um, being snide and arrogant and unhelpful in a forum where people are genuinely coming to try and get assistance, it's just crap. If you're not going to help, then shut up. Don't say anything. Why go and attack someone when all they're asking for is help? It, it, I, I don't understand why. what the mentality is. Someone comes in and says, you know, are there good directories to try and get listed in? Um, for all they know, they, they, the person just wants help, guidance about where they should go. Why, why go and attack them and say, good luck with that, you're an idiot, or there's no good directories, you're a loser, or go and spam somewhere else, you toss her, or some other stupid um, remark um, that's come out of their mouths or fingers countless times before, when they could just come up and say, give them the answer they want. List your business in reputable directories. Ignore the fact that some directories have follow or no follow links. List them in places where it will genuinely help your business. There's a genuine reason to list your business in places like Axiom or Yelp in the US or Yellow Pages in Australia or True Local or Start Local in Australia. Their data gets syndicated into a litany of other businesses that are offline, like places like TomTom or you know GPS navigation providers and things like that. They're the avenue to get your business listed into GPS systems. You don't know it necessarily, but that's where it happens. So there's lots of genuine reasons why you should get your business listed in good quality directories. It doesn't matter that the links are no follow or follow. Who gives a shit? List it where it makes sense, where it's genuinely going to help your business. Just, just be helpful. Why be a douche? I'd like to add that the interview really sort of annoyed me. I'm not TC in Webmasters, but I'm TC in AdSense and Google Plus. And one of the major assets, if you like, or the source of TC's credibility is TC's independence from Google. TC's do not have to toe the party line. TC's are users. TC's are users who are providing peer-to-peer -peer support. And in a sense, for them to become, as it were, surrogate or messenger in an official sort of quasi or semi-official capacity is really sort of blurring the lines, in my opinion. And it would make me quite uncomfortable if I were placed in that kind of situation in the forums that I'm a TC in, because that doesn't, you know, that, that is not my role as a TC in those in AdSense and in Google Plus. If I feel that there's something that is amiss, then I'm free to say so. I do not have to tour the party line. I do not have to, you know, defend Google to the hilt. Um, and you know, I have been critical of Google in public a number of times in certain respects. So in the sense that loading on additional functions onto TCs and other forum regulars, I think is not a particularly great way of providing support regardless of the, um, you know, the personalities involved. That's just my you know, two cents, as it were. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, um, okay. Yeah, well, uh, should we move on from there, or would you like to go deeper with us? Because I, you know, I'm I'm happy to get, go way. with the flow. Either way, I think we've covered quite a lot tonight, um, in the sense of um, Google's. Uh, I was going to say failure, but Google's lack of um, help. Um, you know, in in all sorts of manners. But yeah, yeah. if you want to carry on, cool. I, I don't know if you read or not, but um, my friend Sash um, um, has had a bit to say recently uh, about. Um, um, uh, well, I imagine it's us, um, but um, he doesn't like us um, criticizing Google. He, he thinks that um, we're, we're Google bashers. Um, what? Uh, what? In, the, um, in, the, um, in the help desk hangout um, I watched last week, um, um, he um, is concerned about the Google bashes. Why? I mean, this is a multinational company. It's listed. It's, you know, or, <laughs> boo hoo. Yeah. I'm sorry, but <laughs> you know, if a com if if a multinational company does not provide support um, and cannot stand up to criticism based on um, the way it operates. Tough luck, you know. If you're in the public domain, you're a public company. You must just take it like a man. End off. I just, <laughs> you know. So who cares if? Uh, oh, anyway, that's that's my, you know. I suppose these are the same people, for instance, that all, would also defend Google's um, position that they should pay no tax in virtually every country around the world as well. Um, but hey, you know, uh, what's every government's right to tax a company? Yeah. But by all means, you know, use their UBUT um, taxation black sinkhole to avoid paying tax in virtually every country around the world. I think um, information that came out on like the Australian or something like that, one of the big newspapers in Australia last year, for the last financial year said that Google paid something like $70,000 tax or $100,000 tax in Australia last year. Yeah, Pr pretty pretty sure they earned more than $300,000 of revenue. Pretty, pretty sure. Um, the, uh, online, the online advertising market in Australia is just short of a billion um, and Google owns about 90-odd percent, 89% of that. Um, so um, that's a little you know, bit more so, than three hundred. So for people like um, Sash or whoever to come up and say that people are just bashing Google, I don't think that that's necessarily a fair statement. I think that they deserve the criticism that comes their way when they're not meeting the expectations of literally the internet. It's completely not their fault that they've built an amazingly brilliant, one-of-a-kind product that no one else on the planet can replicate. And it's not their fault for being exceptional. It's not. And I applaud them and I'm their biggest fan and will advocate Google until I die unless something tragic happens. But they've still got a responsibility to service users adequately. And there's so many examples where that is simply not the case. Last year, we had 110 business listings out of Google Places vanish overnight. Nothing changed, they just went away. Have a guess the, the financial impact for a hotel when you don't have business listings anymore. But we just make less money. We don't choose to have Google Places. You have to have it. It's, it's part of online marketing. We didn't do anything. One day they just vanished. They weren't in our account and disapproved or in our account pending review. They just weren't in our account anymore. They, they, it was like we never had them. They weren't in Google Maps. They weren't in our account. They were just gone. And despite us having access to 
you know, Google account managers and all sorts of things to try and help us, you know, navigate our way through Google land on not, not to do with Google Places, but, you know, other things. Um, it was completely useless. And, and they provided absolutely no useful support in this example at all, none. Despite, um, you know, the amount of business that we would send them annually through AdWords, um, you'd think that they'd be able to provide some level of assistance um, to people that do genuinely provide them, you know, a lot of income, but they don't even do that. So if, if you're the business on the corner that that's the milk bar, that you know, that sells milkshakes, um, what chance do you have of getting support from Google? You've got none because, you know, even medium-sized advertisers like a hotel chain like us um, can get very little support. So I think that they deserve the criticism that they get. Any business does. I'm not targeting Google at all. It, you know, if, if, if Apple were the centre of the universe as far as phones went and everyone was using an Apple phone because they built the best phone and there was they had market penetration and they completely dominated um, the smartphone space and their software was absolutely rubbish or a core service was crap or um, the um, the iTunes account platform was flaky and you couldn't log in constantly and authenticate to get access to iTunes or your phone stuff didn't work or iCloud constantly crashed and it was losing customer data or anything like that. Any business that chooses to put themselves at the center of a huge number of people um, and then they can't live up to reasonable expectations from those users for their product, they deserve the criticism they get. I don't see what the issue is. I, I can't see why um, Sash or anyone else would think that criticizing Google legitimately when they're not doing um, a reasonable job of something is is unreasonable. Why should why should everyone sit um, down with their hands in that and say yes sir please sir, um, you're the only person in the world that could possibly satisfy my whim because you're Google. You know you make billions of dollars a year. Do a better job. You know fix Google Places. It's a shit product. <laughs> <laughs> It is actually. I mean, I'm having some. Yeah. Since they start merging with low Google it's, Plus, it's local, a rubbish product. Yeah, I need to sort it out. And, and they're the ones that choose to put that product into the market incomplete, and it's had an absolutely torrid history of um, of issues with it on on so many different levels across you know the last five years or however long Google Places has existed for. Um, and despite their attempts to try and improve things in the last 18 months since Google Plus came around, nothing's changed. You know, they've got inconsistent branding, you've got profiles that are half Google Places, half Google bloody Places Plus, half plus Google Places Local. Like, I don't even know which way's <laughs> up anymore. <laughs> the, 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 the management interface for it's crap. It, everything about it is ratchet. You know, trying to verify business listings if you've got complex phone systems is a friggin' nightmare. Um, you know, they they just choose to take away options to do postcard verification whenever they seem to feel fit to do so. So then you're only left with being able to verify listings through a phone system when you can't get access to a phone system to do it because Google's automated phone call can't pass through PABX system bloody why? But it will go through some other or, one, That's or they won't phone your main phone, or they won't phone the business's main number, and they insist on phoning a mobile number for a business. <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> you know. But on the flip side, you know, I, I'll praise Google until the bloody hilt when they do an amazing job, and they do an amazing job of so many things. It, they literally blow my mind every single day when I go and do something. It, it's, it's staggering what they're able to do. Mind-numbingly awesome at so many levels. Um, but some of the simple things 
particularly where they've got customers, indirectly customers, even though they're not paying Google, they're still a customer. I know that they say um, in their terms of service, you're liable for the amount of money, Google's liable for the amount of money that you've paid Google, which is zero, so we're not liable. <laughs> um, but, but they're their customers, you know, they know that, they're just trying to skirt responsibility. Um, but you know, when they've got, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people using a product to make their business run, and their product management area for that product is lackluster, um, you know, that's not good enough. So, so let's put this into perspective. Look at the quality of something like AdWords as a product, makes Google 95 or 96% of their income. Um, so really important. Gets lots of attention, the interface is amazing, it's got APIs out the wazoo, really comprehensive product. Flip that over and go and look at something like Google Places. Google Places doesn't directly make them money, but it gets businesses into Google Places, and then once businesses get into there, maybe they'll start using um, AdWords Express, which they advertise through Google Places, and then that gets the money. Well, you can't really help but put your business into Google Places because even if you don't add it, it will get sucked into places through a third party data provider. So it's like, well, it's there whether you like it or not. So now you kind of have to manage it. Um, and then the product isn't that great as far as the management goes and resolving duplicates and having businesses, several businesses at one address in a high rise. Um, you know, the number of times we've had our business, hotel business listings um, merged in strange bloody ways with other businesses in the same 50 floor building. I can't tell you where we end up sending um, all of the people that want to call our hotel to a friggin' physiotherapist who, who doesn't even have a receptionist. You know, we've got 200 phone lines that come into a hotel and the physiotherapist has got one phone line. And then for some friggin' reason, our phone number ends up on a physiotherapist's um, business listing. Yeah, that's good. Really quality. <laughs> and, and, and the amount of friggin' effort that it takes to try and address that. It takes weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks. The last time this happened, it took us seven weeks to try and get it fixed. Seven weeks. His business has got a completely different name and it's at a different address, albeit in the same building and a different phone number to us. His business is in a category called physiotherapy. His, his additional information is all about physiotherapy. Gee, I wonder what our category is. We're a hotel. Pretty likely that we've got a different address, a different business name, different categories, different descriptions, different additional information, different everything. But by all means, merge them together at your whim. Fuck it, do it. I don't mind. Do it whenever you want. Because that's okay because then you provide no tools to try and actually fix it. You know, so am I critical of Google when they do a shit-ass job? You bet. Do I love them to death when they do an absolutely amazing job? You bet. They are, they're, they're amazing. Yeah. You've got Andy Wigglesworth in tears, uh, Alistair. <laughs> He's hiding now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I was I, I, I was just thinking while you were talking. I, 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 my feelings are pretty much the same as yours. I, I'm not a Google basher. I, I'm a Google lover. I mean, we're um, I, I'd say to Sash, but um, you know, our group um, we work very very hard for Google. Um, we we um, you know well, we do our best anyway. Uh, um, and, and look, let, let, me, let me read you a, uh, an email, and, and this is an email from a Googler. I pulled it out while you were talking, but um, she said, personally, I wasn't so convinced that we could do these macro conversions because after asking around internally, it did not seem, it, it didn't seem like it has been really done before, even for the very large customers we have. You guys have really gone above and beyond putting a lot of time and effort into coming up with this solution. Um, well, you know, uh, that's uh, us that, that she's talking about, Sash. Um, 
we've we've got a vested interest in um, Google being successful. Um, when, when Google's successful, we're successful too. We love Google. But um, you know, if if a segment of Google, I mean, sesh, uh, if 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 one part of you know, if, if four fifths of Google is doing doing great guns and one part of it, you know, loses its moral compass and goes off the rails and starts doing something which seems plain to me that it will ultimately be destructive of Google, um, like the web, man, web spam team has been this last 12 to 18 months, um, then, um, yeah, damn right I'm going to complain. And um, uh, I don't apologise for it either. If I see them... That, Doing something that's just morally wrong and, and, and won't stand up to scrutiny, um, they can explain it away all they like. But if it won't stand up to scrutiny, ultimately someone is going to pick it apart, and and that will that will damage Google. I don't want Google damaged. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, criticise Google when, when 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 the occasion arises, and I won't apologise for it. Um, so you know. I mean, Sash, uh, you might remember, uh, mate. Um, the, let's talk about um, who's a Google basher and who isn't. Um, uh, you might remember that um, Google wanted to give us both uh, a, a new Chromebook uh, about six months before uh, um, they were released. Um, but the Chromebooks were for US only uh, residents. Now, um, I could have had mine delivered by my New York Dropbox, um, but I knocked mine back uh, because I, I was concerned uh, that exporting crypt cryptography and, and all the rest of it was, would be doing the wrong thing. So I, I knocked mine back. Um, but you had yours delivered uh, via your Houston Dropbox, um, uh, and it went to went to Cyprus. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad or whatever, but you know. Who's got the best interests of Google at heart? Now, who, who really cares about um, Google? I, I, I know I certainly do. Um, and I, I, I don't think, I think you're out of line uh, um, referring to us as Google bashes. The article that you wrote uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago about um, um, toxic domains, it, it, it's just a, um, a, 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 I don't know, it's just a confusion. Fabulation, a, a, a means to try and rewrite some sort of history that, that did not exist. Um, it, it, it's perfectly obvious to everybody that um, this um, toxic domains issue has just arisen since um, uh, Penguin. Um, and uh, um, you're trying to make out that it's always been that way. Well, it hasn't. It's new. And, and so if something new happens that we think is wrong, why shouldn't we complain about it? Why shouldn't we say, um, you know, this is wrong, this, this has to be fixed? I think, you know, um, it, you know if, if you're going to be upset about it, be upset about it, but uh, don't think that we can be shamed into um, uh, pulling our heads in um, because, uh, you know, I think it is you that uh, should pull your head in. Anyway. That's my little render. I got excited then. <laughs> it wasn't me this time. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. It's it's actually fun to watch somebody rant. I'm I'm enjoying myself. I uh, actually I've got a lot more. I could say a lot more. I can I, uh, but I don't think oh, I should. Oh, keep going. I, I I the only thing I would add is is if if you're if if you're a hammer, everything's going to look like a nail. If you if you're on the web spam team and your job is to find web spam, every you you have a natural instinct to look at things in in that light. If you're a TC and you've spent years defending Google's positions, you're naturally when somebody comes up and says you something bad about your the the person that you've been, the company you've been defending, you're going to be a little bit upset about that and you're going to try to defend it. I understand the psychological aspects of it. I, I really do. And, uh, but I think, as Sash would say, at the end of the day, you have to stay, take a step back and you have to say, 
what's right and what's wrong. Does it make sense? And and just like some of the argument with the the um, the Mozilla thing, you know, we don't want to give Mozilla too much information. We don't want to give the public too much information. They, you know, we have no right to have Google secret sauce. Well, nobody's saying anything about secret sauce. I'm just saying that maybe if you pointed it out in the first place, it wouldn't have became public. So if then you start getting into that where you start saying, well, do they really want it public? That's where I you kind of can get off the rails and say and, and go down the wrong track. But I love Google. I use it every day. I get stuff sent to me by Google. Um, the last thing, I, I got two coffee cups sent to me. I, I think Google's great. Uh, but, I, but I also don't think that if if they do something wrong that I should not criticize them just because I get a coffee mug or a Chromebook or, you know, some free advertising. Did you get a free homebrew? I did not. Oh, right. You just said I that. got my I, I got my well I was saying that for you. I mean, you know, if you get a, if you if you're getting I mean, obviously, I mean I'm not in the I'm not on the forums. I I, I don't find it that useful. And to be quite honest, I I think you get the company line when you go when you go to the webmaster forums. You're going to get answers that are really not, for the most part, a lot of people might, might get some help by it. And I agree that you know you should probably go check it out. Maybe you should ask in the, in the forums. Um, I, I know Mac has Mac Cuts has been in there, and he's answered some questions. It's clear that he's looked at the forums and seen kind of the the give and take and the back and forth. Um, and directing people to go to those forums, you have to assume that Matt Cut supports what's going on in the forums. That makes sense, right? And Matt Cut says, well, you know, you, we penalized your site, go to the forums. And he's been there, he's seen what's going on. That's acceptable. So if you're over at the forums and you see top contributors being nasty to people or you don't like how they're treating people who ask questions, that's... Google's policy. That's what Google wants. I mean, you can't look at what Google says all the time. You have to look at what Google, how Google acts. If you're representing Google in, in the forums and you treat somebody like an asshole, you shouldn't be a top contributor. Uh, the TCs are not representing Google. TCs are not representatives of Google. TCs right. do not speak on behalf of Google. TCs are independent, and that's the main asset of TCs in the forum environment. In there, I think that's who makes that's who who, de who determines who a TC is. Um, I think it's well, it's it's so discretion of um, Google. Um, okay, can, <laughs> that's my you, point. It's a Google can, forum. It's a yeah, Google forum. So, yeah, but um, yeah, um, there's a whole page on TCs. Um, I could find it for well, you. That, I guess I, I think you're absolutely yeah. correct. You're absolutely correct. TCs are not yeah. employees of Google. I get yeah. that. Uh, and I think that and that carries another. Yet at the same time, TCs are a very visible presence. You know, you, we have badges and things like that, and we are always there. So um, you know, people naturally assume that TCs know things better. And to a certain extent, yes, but that's primarily based on TC's personal experiences. You know, they would be running websites or they'd be running AdSense accounts, they'd be using Google Plus, um, they'd be using all sorts of different products that they have product forums for. So, and TC's are not privy to any information. You know, TC's do not have any access to any sort of private information because that's between the user and Google. TCs are not Google employees. They're not covered by any sort of disclosure thing. So that TCs won't have any access to any private information. TCs can only work on what is publicly available, publicly accessible, and what the posters in forums decide to disclose if they're not publicly available. So TCs are operating on this very limited information base because TCs can only see what most, you know, what everyone else can see. 
not what Google sees. Um, for that reason, TCs tend to be more careful and tend to toe the party line to the extent that they have to advise things that TCs know to be correct and safe. Because to advise something that may fall into the gray zone, and particularly to the sort of the darker shades of gray, that's risking your, that's risking TCs reputation as a collective body and as individuals. Because posters might come back and say, look, I've implemented what you suggested. And I followed you. I followed your suggestion because you're TC. And look what look what happened to me. So um, where, where where does being a douche fall into this? Where I does mean, what? Where where does where does being a douchebag fall into this? That's what I, that's what my question is. Because my my, I mean, my comment before was if I was Google and I looked at the behaviour and the way that some of the TCs reply to people in the webmaster forum. I would just remove it. If I was Google, I wouldn't want, because you can say that you're independent, um, and you can say that all day long. TCs are representatives endorsed by Google because of their knowledge. Indirectly, one way or the other, people that come into the webmaster forum see the little green thingy beside your name that says TC or whatever, um, and they know this person knows what they're talking about. That's, they get the green thing because Google says that they're knowledgeable, and then someone that's got the little green thingy comes up and is just being a complete rude asshole. Why would Google want someone with an attitude like that representing them? And they're representing them. You can say that they're not. They are. Well, when Matt well, Cutts sends them over there, I mean, that's the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. you got pe go here to get your answers for your mm -hmm. problems, but they're all independent. Well. That Hence my sort of annoyance, you know, a few minutes back. I said, you know, that's, that's what I didn't like about it because it sort of compromises their position. Um, TC's positions are solely in the forum. I mean, it doesn't extend beyond that. I mean, people can take it, try to take it beyond it. But, um, you know, it's basically valid, if you like, only within the <coughs> forums. And as for personalities and uh, decisions, you know, that's, you know, that. I can't really comment because I'm not, I'm not a TC in Webmasters. I'm TC in AdSense and Google Plus, and these two forums are totally different in tone and tenor of things, how things are done. So, it it really depends. I cannot, I cannot really comment um, beyond sort of the generalities about TCs, um, and I can't really comment on the sort of the specifics of individual forums. Well, that's that's a problem to a certain degree. Yeah, is is you know, it's if you're a TC and somebody's coming in and asking a question, you have to toe the party line. You're you're not you're not going to a certain degree. You have to you have to you can't really go outside of the guidelines there and say give give recommendations or anything. Yeah. Um, that, you have that's... information. Right. So basically, what you're saying is Google's saying, to a certain point, if a website has a penalty, and I'm the average Joe on the street, and I go over to Webmaster Forums and I run into one of the TCs there by me asking a question, I have no idea because I've been directed by Matt Cuts by Google itself that this is our policy. You get a penalty. This is where you go. I'm following Google's what I'm supposed to do to fix it. I end up showing up there and I get, you know, some, some, well, you can't use bad links. Bad links are not good for your site. You shouldn't use press releases or you shouldn't do this. Or you shouldn't do that. And it's basically right out of the guidelines. Um, they have no special magical powers to see what Google sees. So really you're just guessing. Yeah. It's, and, it's basically best guesswork that. that right. And, and you're, you're raking people over the coals, and in reality, who are you? I mean, you, you know, you can't really. You know, you're just you're just somebody trying to help somebody else out. Yeah. And you get some you get some rewarded by trying to help somebody out by becoming a top contributor, and that's good. But I think after a period of time, it starts to get kind of where um, you you start getting that kind of attitude. 
Um, not everybody gets paid like Matt Cutts. Not everybody has that position. Not everybody can sit down and have the the control that Matt Cutts has by not blowing up or not going off the handle with with somebody. I admire Matt Cutts beyond uh, imagination. I, I I just really do admire him because I could never control myself like Matt Cutts does. And to ask that from your TCs in the same tone as Matt Cutts, where it's it's always professional and very patient, I think is asking a lot. So I get their frustration. I really do. You know, they see it time and time and time again. Oh, I got a penalty. I got dropped. Here's my link profile. And then the, then the TCs go off and say, you see, it's the link profile. What they forget is, is this person's brand new coming into the forums. Um, and then you have the same thing that Lyndon said. You know, somebody shows up because they hired they, they got hired by an SEO they got hired by a company to do SEO. They show up in the forums to get their answers to go back to the to the uh, their client, which isn't isn't quite fair. But I have clients too, myself personally. And if I don't know an answer, I'm going to ask. And and the, the client's really paying me to 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 know where to go to ask the question. Sorry, but that's that's capitalism. You have to you have to just suck that up. I mean, I'm sorry about that, but that's the way the world works. I I don't know. I I think if you're gonna, I I, I get both sides of this. I I think you can defend Google to a certain degree, but you also you start you start looking a little bit silly when every single thing that comes out you're defending everything. Even even when people say, "Geez, this is wrong." I mean, Google. If if Google was a person and they walked down the street and shot somebody in the head, you'd be saying, "Well, you know what? <sighs> they probably deserve getting deserve shot." That's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I no, I certainly see that. Um, it's I think um, you know being on the. As it on the other side, certainly in AdSense and Google+. <laughs> you got a tough Plus. position. You have a tough uh, position. No, no, no. I, know. I certainly see it from both sides because I have been asking questions in other product forums, and then, uh, and then I come across and think, oh, right, okay. Well, that's good. Um, you know, um, face me. Um, it is very difficult, and I think TCs are more aware of these issues than perhaps posters would. Um, would see um, it. It this is a placed in a sort of awkward position, especially something like webmasters, because um, it's not a pure um, consumer product. If you see what I mean, it's not like oh, how do I do this? How do I do that? Can I you know what do I need to fix in order to get this thing right? It's more than that. It's it could be as Andy was. Um, Typing in the chat, you know, it, we we might be talking about someone's livelihood. We might be talking about someone's business. It, you know, it it can be a quite serious thing. And if a site has been penalised and cannot get out in a few weeks, that would be enough time period for a business to go under. <coughs> so you know, we're talking about extremely serious cases. I think more than perhaps a uh, oh, I don't know how to you know watch YouTube clips, or I don't know what's happening with my Google Plus account. You know, in terms of degree of seriousness of the potential issues that come into the forum, Webmasters, I think, is a lot different from uh, most other Google products and services. And so in that sense, I find it hard to stomach that Google is placing so much of the support role, or placing that support role onto the forum, because there's a limit to what TCs or forum regulars can do. Because they, you know, there isn't sufficient information to go on. Um, well, well I, I've heard people say, and this is this is the, and I guess this is the the nuclear option when you're talking about anything is 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 that if you own a website, um, you're not Google's customer. The customer is the visitor. So anybody beyond the visitor, they don't care, or not that they don't care. It's you know it's it's their main focus is on the visitor. So if your main focus is on the visitor, and that's the most important thing, and I agree it should be very important, then 
having support for the other side of this is not their priority. Having collateral damage is not their priority. And if, if they change an algorithm and it tanks a certain percentage of websites, but they feel like in, in the long run, not immediately, not immediately, but in the long run, the search results are going to be better for their visitor. They are going to do that. Oh, yeah. They are going to make that decision every single time. Oh, yeah. So, and that makes sense. And it's an and I almost see it as a, an afterthought, where oh we killed a bunch of these websites now they're complaining we're, we may get some bad press or or you know we really do feel a little bit bad about this so now let's try to give them a way to get come out of it just like with the panda or, or the penguin update they had this update about bad links then they realized that there is no way there is no mechanism to fix this problem if you had it and the uh, one of the pieces of advice that matt cuts gave start over Start over. That's what he said. You, if it's really bad, you may have to start over. Well, how do I know whether I'm going to be wasting my time with this website? And how do I know whether I'm going to start over? Where, you know, why don't you just tell me your site's done, dude? Move on. Start over. You can't. You know, why is this up in the air? And they had no mechanism. They had no disavow tool. They had no way of, of fixing this issue. And they and they released this update with not giving a second thought about how it was going to affect people's livelihoods. And then in, in, yeah, in, to, to be fair, we, we don't know any of that. Um, I mean, to be fair. Um, well, I we, mean, we, don't know we know the facts. We know the facts. We, we, know the, we know the outcome. Well, we know that Google did a, a Penguin update. We know they had no, play, no way to do a disavow tool. They, they they knew that they had no way of a website being able to determine whether they were, um, whether their site was going to be done for good and they needed to start over or whether they needed to work on it. So we all know that is fact, right? So the outcome of the, the, the Penguin update was that, that they did it without, with, without having a disavow tool. So, well, you know, who says that? Who said they got one now? I, I well, think that they're probably <laughs> scurrying, scurrying to, to build one uh, to make good on uh, the rhetoric. So, so let me just clarify and put a disclaimer in here that it's my, in my opinion, in my opinion, they gave very little thought to how websites could correct uh, a penalty that was caused by Penguin when they released the algorithm update. I don't think that was their main focus on the algorithm update. I think their focus was to get rid of spam and to make the, web, the, the search results better eventually. Maybe not right away, but eventually make it better. And, and the end result of that was by not paying attention or maybe by design, I don't know. My opinion is, is they just, it just slipped through the cracks. They weren't thinking in terms of how does a website get back into good graces. They, that wasn't their, in my opinion, it wasn't, it's it, clearly to me, it wasn't a concern. If it were a concern, would they not have had the disavow tool before they launched the update? And if it was a concern, really a concern, in my opinion, they could have done the disavow tool a lot quicker than what they did. Bing had it up in a matter of weeks. Yeah, the, well, the, the disavow tool's been talked about since about 2007. Uh, I remember um, Matt Cutts uh, asked the question uh, uh, at a conference, um, you know, would, would you want a um, disavow tool? And, and, and every hand at the conference went straight up. Um, and that was, you know, four or five years ago. So, um, you know, I mean, apparently that there's, and, and, and I, I, I don't profess to, to know, I, I just, you know, just from just just from read, reading, just like everybody else. Uh, but apparently, there's been a lot of resistance towards um, having a disavow tool in the first place. Um, yeah, because well, disavow tool is, to a certain extent, and pushing it, you know, putting it aside in an extreme fashion, is a, if you like, an admission of failure. That 
they are, um, you know, they basically had been inflating the worth of links that shouldn't have been, and now they found a way to move that and potentially penalize it by adding a punitive element to um, not only devaluing but actually actively harming and punishing um, sites that have dodgy links. Um, so, and then to a certain extent, then there is the possibility of other people, third parties, pointing links to another site, which Google won't be able to distinguish in terms of the intent as an identity. So, you know, who placed what links for what purpose? You know, I don't think Google can reasonably determine the identity and intent of a link to a degree that it would be safe to say, okay, you know, um, this person had intended to manipulate the rankings and therefore place this link. Therefore, it's going to be not only devalued, but it's going to carry some sort of penalty. Um, I'm not so sure if it, if it is a penalty or not in this sense that it has an actively harming and punishing effect. But let's assume that it does. Um, the fact that disavowal tool has to come in shows that Google couldn't distinguish these. So they were potentially targeting ones that they couldn't distinguish. Therefore, they needed a tool that would clean the slate to a certain extent. Mm. If I made my, if I made sense, I'm getting sort of slightly drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly made sense. Uh, um, I was just trying to think back through the whole conversation to see how we could sum up and move on because we do have a lot of questions. Um, uh, nobody else want want to add anything? Who's that good sword you've got with you, Tim Kappa? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Well, look, um, I, I won't try to sum sum all of that up. It was just so uh, so much to it. Um, we we had um, um, Alistair's passionate um, lecture. Um, of course, uh, Andy Wigglesworth to cry tears of, of laughter. Um, yes, it, it was it was hell in there at one stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, look, I, I think it's healthy to to um, um, do that, and um, yeah, uh, I'm glad that I was able to respond to Sash. Uh, I imagine he was referring to me when. Uh, uh, he wrote uh, semi semi coherent loons. Um, I guess he's referring to my stutter, but um, I'm working on it, Sash. I'll I'll, I'll try to improve. But, put little um, put little pebbles uh, in your mouth. <laughs> and uh, I, I see also in last week's hangout that uh, Sash is uh, wanting to write something controversial. Um, he intends to write something controversial. Well, really, mate, we, we're not really looking for controversies. Um, we're, we just rather report on, on the issues um, as they stand. We don't need to fabricate them. There's plenty uh, to talk about um, without um, beating anything up. Um, so no controversies needed. Um, there are no controversies that I can say. I mean, there's only the, the truth that we speak, and, and uh, um, Sasha's uh, attempts to rewrite history. Um, but the rhetoric from here is still that Sash is still my admired and respected friend, and um, I can't wait to see what he says after uh, he sees this clip. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Anybody want to add anything? No? no okay. Right, let's go before I say anything any more stupid. Um, all right. Um, oh, look, I'm going to skip the next one. That's another one I posted. It was um, just. Re or or do, you want, do you want to talk on it, Alistair? Um, Amazon um, with their uh, cookie cutter uh, pages. Um, spamming the keyword term Google Glass and, and pre-order Google Glass and so on and pretending on Amazon that they've actually got the product there? 
I, I actually wondered about this, whether or not um, if this was essentially automated. Yeah, it definitely would be. Um, you know, they're seeing search volume for these keywords, so their system is spinning out landing pages ahead of time. I, I, um, I, th I think it is. It, it's the search engine uh, land um, uh, method of um, website production. It's interesting because did, did I say something? despite Amazon being um, obviously a very powerful site, um, that page or Amazon makes um, no headway in the search results in the first two pages at least or three pages of the search results for say Google Glass. So I don't know. It's it's a bizarre thing. If it is automated, it's an interesting thing because you know um, that would constitute a doorway page as far as Google's quality guidelines are concerned um, and making pages for search engines. Um, and that would warrant a penalty. But I don't suppose Google are about to penalise Amazon. Yeah, exactly. It's um, one rule for some. Okay. Um, any, any other comments on uh, this uh, Amazon spam? Yeah. Kate Toon asks, uh, why does my site rank well on Google but not on Bing? Uh, I get asked this question all the time and I'm interested in your viewpoint. This is fundamentally really simple. Um, Google and Bing are separate businesses, or Google and Microsoft are separate businesses, and the algorithms that their search engines use are independent of one another. Um, and you could be, for instance, meeting the algorithmic guidelines ranking signals in Bing and not in Google, or vice versa. Um, so you could rank well in one and not in the other. So the simple answer is they're different. Um, I would probably urge you to assess which search engine holds the market share in the markets that you're interested in ranking in um, and learn to understand what a quality website looks like as those algorithms are concerned and pursue that. For instance, the quality guidelines for um, Beidou or Yandex in terms of how they rank a Chinese website or a Russian website um, could be quite different in terms of how that what they perceive to be quality um, compared to what Google constitutes to be quality for the same search phrase. So given that Yandex holds the market share in Russia, it would obviously seem pertinent that if you're pursuing Russian, you would become pretty familiar with the ranking factors as Russian websites would have it. So I would just pay attention to what search engines are um, important for your markets, learn to understand them, and they're different because they're different businesses. Cool. Okay. Al Silver asks, hey guys, uh, good to see you again. I'm back with another question for you awesome people. So I've been optimizing a website for Romanian users and I've been writing the content in Romanian. Some of our main keywords are spelled correctly with diacritics. But the thing is that people don't search them on Google like that. Um, don't, don't make me try to pronounce this. I, I, I won't, uh, won't succeed. I, I'll, I'll just give up now. Uh, he continues to say, now everyone is saying that content is king and you should also always aim for the great user experience. So it makes sense to spell the words correctly. Uh, he's meaning with the diacritics. But considering the fact that people search for terms without diacritics, I'm wondering how Google sees this situation. So in your, your experience, should I go for the correct words with the diacritics or the searched ones um, without diacritics? Thanks a bunch, guys. Well, my, my take, before anybody else answers, uh, um, my, my take is that 
yeah, Google knows um, that the, the diacritic is there, and, and that the user will may may have a keyboard that'll type it or may not, um, and, and we'll take that into account. Uh, I, 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 if if the word is properly with a diacritic, or for argument's sake, the, the one that uh, everybody thinks about is, is the uh, um, the apostrophe. Um, or, or whether to use the apostrophe or not, and uh, I think write it properly, write it as, as it should be written, and let Google take care of um, the um, nuances of you know, dif dif different languages and so on. And, and they they do that do that fine. It's nice to be able to say something good about Google, isn't it? So it's a pretty timely question, actually, this because. Um uh, one of the search engine um, agencies in Adelaide, I think they're in, um, Quasi Studios, they put up a post today about this exact problem. Um, so the example they gave was when to use an apostrophe or not. In this particular instance, it was to do with Father's Day. Um, the search volume for Father's Day, spelt with an apostrophe, um, is really low, you know, 500. The search volume for Father's Day with no apostrophe is 165,000, for instance, massively bigger. Um, and the search results, when you do the two search phrases with and without an apostrophe, change. The first three results don't. They're Wikipedia, timeanddate.com, and IMDB. Um, but once you get down below that, the results start to change. So it is an interesting um, position to be in. The comment that I left on um, quasi-studios.com website was that um, I would tend to write it properly um, in in the appropriate spelling, with or without the um, directs or you know apostrophes or whatever it might be. Only because um, recently, or Google have been saying for quite some time that indirectly, um, the quality, copywriting quality is a signal. It's not, it's not necessarily a ranking factor. But as an example, um, you know, back in 2010, um, Google put in stuff into search to do, so you could search by reading level. As an example, with and um, it might have been ranked using the Flesh Kincaid um, reading level algorithm or some other ones. There's several of them. Um, when Google Panda first rolled out, um, Amit Singh, one of the Google um, chief algorithm wranglers, wrote an article about understanding what the traits were of high quality websites, and he gave a list of about 25 bullet points of the things that have got nothing to do with technical mumbo jumbo, but they're purely concepts to do with what you might consider or perceive to be a high quality website. Um, four of the points that he happened to list out of the 25 were things that indirectly lead towards the quality of copywriting. Does an article have spelling, stylistic or factual errors? Um, how much quality control is done on the content? Was the article edited well? Does it appear to be sloppy or hastily produced? Are the pages produced with great care and attention to detail versus less attention to detail? Um, then in August um, of 2011, AJ Cohn asked a question about whether or not spelling and grammar were ranking factors in Google, i.e. are you actually going to have a website go up or down simply because you've got spelling errors in a website? And Matt Cutts came back and said, no, it won't directly affect your rankings. But it might make sense that we could do that. And he also mentioned the fact that websites that have got higher page rank have got higher quality editing, i.e. they've got less grammatical errors, they've got less spelling errors, um, and all of those kinds of things, which simply goes towards the fact that I think websites that are high quality, just in general, tend to attract more links, um, and that someone's more likely to link to a well-presented, well-edited website than a sloppy website. Um, so I'd be inclined to focus on writing um, correctly with with the language nuances or 
the local dialects of language or using local phrasing if you are if there were several variations of language in the regions that you're targeting I'd be inclined to use the language that the people in the area use to describe the content or business or whatever it might be um, and rely on Google to do their job because ultimately the things that are going to make you rank for Father's Day with and without an apostrophe is not going to be the fact that you do or don't have an apostrophe. It's going to be all of the other things around your website that lead towards your website being relevant to Father's Day as a search phrase, as an example. It's not the fact that you have or haven't got an apostrophe or that a word does or doesn't have an umlaut over it. It's not that. It's, it's all of the other 200 plus factors that Google use when assessing um, you know, the, the, the indexing process and ranking process for a website. Okay. Cool. Um, well, the Masataki um, pulled up um, a couple of queries. I'm just trying to have a, have a look. Perhaps you'd like to speak on them, um, Masataki. I uh, search the terms that the uh, poster uh, posted and the first few results are the same and this is on Google Romania and choosing Romanian as, as the language and there are slight variations on the first page um, I'm based in the UK so I don't think that's going to in the, as long as it's Roma Google Romania in Romania I don't think my location would change much in terms of the um, search uh, change the search results. Um, the first few results are the same, but then I think about one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, and nine. I think seven and beyond are slightly different. So there does seem to be a slight difference in terms of um, whether you have a diacritic, whether you have diacritics or not. Um, Though it may be insignificant, it's. I think it's probably the same sets of sites that appear, but in slightly different orders. So I would generally go along and and use the diacritics and spell things properly. I think that is. Yeah. Okay. Andy, what what, what do you have to say about all this? <laughs> Okay. Right, will we move on to the next question? Oh, just one quick thing about that actually, Jim, that just popped into my head. One thing Google has said about this before, um, and they've got a webmaster page in their help section about this, is um, to do with internationalizing or localizing websites. Um, and the, the guidance from Google on this basically is that um, you should use the um, the language as it's used in the area. So the example I think they give in the webmaster document is um, you're a bike website and you've got an English website, a French website, German website, you know, whatever it might be, all selling push bikes. Um, and when they localize the content across these different websites, they go from having an English URL with English titles, English description, English content, on the French website, the URL is completely different and it's in French and it includes um, Unicode characters to produce, um, you know, the umlauts or whatever the, the special characters are the French might use or, or German or, or whatever it might be. So the, the, they're suggesting in that help document that you should be pursuing ultimately the language variations that produce highly relevant um, signals to either Google or searches users. Um, if the user is in um, Romania and they speak Romanian, then they're going to understand easily the um, URL that includes, for instance, the um, the hats and additional characters. Um, so you should use that, and your title tags should use those, um, and your description tags and the content within your website should all include it as well. Because ultimately, it's a 
it's as much a relevancy signal, I think, for users to make your web page look like it's a good match for the phrase that you've typed as it is for Google to understand that this web page, it really is Romanian. It's not on .row domain, but it's a hybrid of English and Romanian. This really is Romanian because other components that Google talk about with this, for instance, are, um, you know, don't mix languages on the same page, as an example. Um, and that because Google's uh, language detection or geotargeting stuff looks at things like the visible language on the page and things of that nature. So if, if this is unlikely, I suppose, because Romanian is obviously um, quite different to English in terms of probably a language structure. Um, but I suppose it would be just as important to pursue the relevancy aspect of that with the foreign language. Um, whether it was Romanian for Romanians or English for English speaking people as it would be for um, French speaking Canadians or French speaking um, Frenchmen. Okay. Anybody else? Well, the next one, um, look, uh, with, with, with your permission, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, answer this next question. It's from Sajid Ali and uh, he asks which Alexa ranking is good, um, lowest or highest? Um, an Alexa traffic rank uh, of 70 is good or an Alexa traffic rank of 7,000 is better? Well, there's a couple of answers, um, uh, Sajid. Uh, uh, 70 is um, means that the, the traffic notionally has higher traffic but really uh, Alexa it, it's not a metric that um, is respected it's it's not something that I mean it's not a check that you can take to the bank it, it's 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 a rank that uh, can be easy, easily manipulated if you put um, five or six guys uh, um, in the same office using Alexa toolbar uh, and working on your site, you'll find that um, your Alexa traffic rank will shoot shoot up um, dramatically. So, for that reason, it, it's it's not really something that you need need to be concerned about. Does that cover it? Do you think, Alistair? Yep. Okay. I hope I'm pronouncing this pretty. Uh, <laughs> I'll try, Guillaume. Uh, Boucher Ballinger. Um, I wonder if he's French. He says, hi guys, uh, I have a simple question for you, yet it is not easy to figure out. I've been in the SEO business for less than a year now and, and I'm wondering why people always talk about optimizing the titles of a website. I'm looking at my competitors and the competitors of my clients and a lot of them don't respect the maximum length of titles in the Google search engine. The problem is that they rank better than my client's website for some keywords that I've placed on my client's optimized titles and that we cannot even see on, on, on Google search pages for my client's competitors. I've also created good content where I've placed the keywords and, and still other websites with non-optimized titles as showing first or ahead of my client's website. Do you guys think it's best to respect the maximum characters of a title for the client size on Google search engine pages? Or do you think that it's best to put uh, more keywords to a title without respecting the maximum title length in Google's eyes? So um, there's been a fair few tests run on this over the years. And um, there's not really a, a practical maximum to the length of a title tag. Um, they used people used to aggressively optimize title tags for the visible character space. Um, and more recently, um, the title tag that shows up in the search results. I think the last test that was run shows that it's actually based on the pixel width of the title and not to do with the character count. So for instance, if you could fit um, 150 letter L's in the title tag, 
because the letters are very narrow, but you'd be able to fit um, 65 letter M's, which are very wide, in the title tag, as an example. Um, so that's, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is that Google index the content of the title tag past what's visible in the title tag. And you can test this for yourself if you like using um, advanced query operators in Google. Uh, so I wouldn't be hell-bent on worrying about the exact length of the title tag. I'd make sure that your highest priority keywords and phrases are in the visible section of the um, title because if the highest priority keywords are not in the visible section of the title, it's likely that your if your page ranks, it'll, it'll appear less relevant to a searcher compared to, for instance, other pages that do carry their search phrase in the first seven words of the title tag, for instance. Um, so that's what I would do there. In terms of the some of your clients' competitors' websites outranking you, it's not necessarily because their title tag is shorter or longer than yours. Um, there's a raft of different things, different signals that go into ultimately ranking the site. Google have been saying for 10 years that they use over 200 different signals to rank a web page. Um, everything from the number of links, the quality of the links, diversity of the links, the link text that points to your site, whether it's a local business, does it have a Google Places page? You know, if, you've, if it is a local business, do you have citations for your name, address, and phone number? Is your name, address, and phone number consistent across business directories? Is it on your website? Is your local business listing in Google Places in the right business categories? Um, you know, the, the list of things to cover off in terms of different tactics to apply to SEO, depending on the business and the vertical that you're chasing, um, they're, they're pretty wide and varied. So it's not as simple as your client's tag is shorter or longer. There's, there's a, a raft of other things that go into it. Um, if you haven't read it already, I'd, I'd definitely recommend reading the, um, the Google SEO starter guide that they published um, a year or two ago. It's, it's a you know, 10 page PDF that kind of goes through um, a whole bunch of high level things that Google tend to look at. Um, it'd also be worth going through, say, the Search Engine Land SEO guide or the SEO Moz SEO guide or um, Distilled You, which they've now made free, I think, as well, which is an online search learning um, website now. Um, might also be a really good place to um, get some ideas. Um, and if your business, your client's business is a local business, um, you should definitely have a look at David Mim's local search ranking factors. Um, he, he interviews a whole bunch of SEOs from around the world every year. Um, that do local SEO. Um, he questions them, you know, with a hundred different questions, collates all of the answers, and then, you know, you get to learn from the wisdom of a hundred other SEOs around the world about what sorts of tactics are working this year compared to last. So that's what I'd say. Sort of like we do every Thursday night. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> just not, just not as broad. Okay. Um, our number one fan, Sloam Zudnik, uh, asks, uh, Hello everyone. Uh, the, the website I'm working on currently is simply huge. Um, 830k pages in the index. There are 778k backlinks. Most of the backlinks come from several language versions of the uh, website in question. All of them go only to the home page, and the home page is disallowed in robots text. Brackets, uh, no idea why. The number of pages in the index is constantly decreasing. Would you recommend to disavow all the links from uh, different language versions of the website? Uh, thanks in advance for the answers. Well, I definitely wouldn't disavow them. That's the first thing. Hmm. Um, that makes no sense in, in my head. Um, if the businesses are related to one another and they're different language versions of the same site, then they should absolutely be linking together because that's good for users. That's how I would look at that. 
Um, the thing that is interesting about his comment though, he says the number of pages in the index is constantly decreasing. So it's got 830,000 pages today. Obviously it must have had more pages than that in the past. Um, I, I would be interested to know how it's been disallowed in the robots file. So for instance, you can't disallow a home page um, in the robots or text file unless the home page is like um, slash index.htm. Um, because if his home page is actually slash, which it is on virtually every website, then if his robots.txt file currently says user agent colon star disallow colon slash, he's actually blocking Google from every single page on his website. Um, and if that's been in place for quite some time, um, and, and this is not a new change, then that could very well be why he does have a depleting number of pages in the index. Um, that does Slora may provide any other info in the um, comments? I don't think so. Um, there were, there, he he um, did did respond, but um, he didn't didn't did, didn't mention that, uh, Alison. Right. Yeah. Look, I, I, to start with, I would be um, whenever I come into sites with a lot of content indexed, um, I start looking at um, what's indexed, where are all of the pages coming from, and what I end up doing is I start constructing a whole bunch of advanced search queries in Google and hiving out different sections of the site, identifying, for instance, certain folders that have got huge numbers of index pages, and then basically going site colon domain minus in URL colon and then a section to hive off that section of the search query so I can drill into more and more and more pages. And then I keep a track in Excel of the number of pages that are indexed in those different sections according to Google to get a quick feel for the volume of pages that are indexed by section. And I'll also do the same basic kind of thing for um, different sorts of query arguments. For instance, you might find that's an e-commerce website and um, they've got uh, pagination running through their site. So you've got you know page one through X for every single category. Um, I'll do advanced queries to basically find out how many um, paginated URLs are indexed. If the e-commerce store also supports sorting, filtering, faceted navigation, I'll start drilling into all of those kinds of things as well to find out what volume of content is indexed under all of those kinds of sections of the site. Um, dub, 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 non dub, dub, HTTP, HTTPS, all of those kinds of things and try to get a real feel for why in God's name would they have 830,000 pages indexed. Um, because there's probably not a lot of websites on the internet that legitimately, legitimately have a million pages in them. Um, you know, that's a, an awfully large website. So it's a big job though. It'll take a bit of time. <laughs> Okay. Um, will we go on with the next one? Yeah. Right. So, um, this is a ni a ni not so much a question, but um, I, uh, Rotimi Orams uh, says, I have listened to the audio version of Demo CEO Questions uh, episode uh, 18 about three or four times. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It had it all, a lot of great insight and quite a bit of humour. Um, but anyway, my question is, do you think the big search engines should be working on ways to trace offenders that place that plant harmful links on pointing at their com competition's websites? Or should they at least help webmasters by providing software tools that can warn against foreign links immediately they are attached to their domains. Well, my suggestion, I mean, 
you know, uh, you, that, uh, I, I think that they should build a link disavowal tool myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the hits just keep on coming. <laughs> Anyway, guys, what do you think? Um, look, it would be really great if Google did provide um, some more help for webmasters to diagnose issues. And we, if, if you've listened to this whole um, Hangout tonight, you'll have heard us rail on this a little bit already. But the information that Google provides through Webmaster Tools when something goes wrong um, is is pretty light, and in in virtually every instance, it's not really going to help most webmasters truly understand what's going on. So I think that Google could be a lot more transparent with this information. And in terms of the providing software tools to warn against foreign links immediately, um, they they could they could help you with that simply by making webmaster tools more fresh. Um, you know, if they did that alone, that would be a big help um, because the data that's in webmaster tools has got quite a lag on it currently. So if they at least made the data in there faster and fresher, it would help. Um, one of the Australian SEOs that comes into here all the time, Dan Petrovich, has got a, a tool that he's written called Fresh Link Finder, which lets you hooks into um, your web server query logs in Google Analytics and a little JavaScript that you run on the site to help surface um, links coming to your website as fast as is reasonably possible. So if someone's referred from domain A and they come to your website and someone clicks the link, um, his tool will pick that up and surface it for you so you can evaluate it and potentially ask someone to remove the link or maybe change the link text or whatever it might be. It doesn't really matter. Um, so it might be worth having a look at, at um, a tool like that. Um, so it's called Fresh Link Finder anyway, and it's by Dijon SEO. Um, but yeah, that Google should be providing more tools to help with this. They say they don't need to because for the most part, this is not really an issue that affects most businesses. Um, but you know, there's plenty of reports on the internet of people that have been genuinely affected by people sort of systematically attacking their websites across a period of time. And, and Jim can talk to this and has talked about it countless times before as well, about his ShopSafe site being um, basically uh, hammered through these kinds of tactics. So it definitely happens. Um, and it would be great if Google provided more tools and insight just to help, even if they're not letting go of the secret source, just to help with the diagnosis aspect so that webmasters or SEOs can at least spend the time devoting their energy into the right aspects of a site to help it improve as opposed to you know potentially wasting time fixing problems that are not actually a problem so to speak yeah um, if anyone's interested in carrying out some negative SEO uh, you just need to go and buy some at uh, seoclarks.com. Um, I was thinking of um, if you if you have trouble finding the the people selling uh, negative SEO on seoclarks.com, you should use a site query operator. That's S I T E full colon all lower case um, seoclarks.com, and then just enter negative SEO because it's not actually. Um, it's 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 like when you go to uh, the milk bar and buy one of those naughty magazines. They're behind the counter, so you just do a site query and you can find all the all the operators there selling uh, negative SEO. Um, and there's even one there I just saw recently. Uh, he's offering to take down any site on the internet for one hundred dollars US. Um, pay only on success. So you tell me, is there such a thing as negative SEO? Anyway, um, let's go to the next. Uh, Adam Van Vrunken asks, a lot of employers are asking for SEO and SEM experience. What is the best way to learn the ins and outs of SEO? Um. 
Oh, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, <clears throat> I, I think what one of the best ways is to go get a job working for an SEO firm. Um, that would, or as an intern. I think you should go to Google Webmaster Guidelines and the Academy and read everything over and over again. Just don't read it once, read it several times. And and do and build your own website from start to finish. If you don't know how to do something, find out how to do it. So get web hosting, um, upload a WordPress blog or another whatever site kind of see a, a content management system you prefer and set it all up and and utilize what you've learned in Google Webmaster Tools and Google website or Webmaster Academy to actually set that site up. In the meantime, as you're doing that, you should also try to be in the industry as if you have to break into as an intern and learn through experience and working with others and be, get involved in, in communities like this one. There's a lot of other communities out there. There's a lot of, you can also read um, some, some uh, things like uh, the, the um, what is it, the anatomy of a large hypertext search engine by Sergey and Larry. That's a good place to start to understand that. Um, if you do read that, it's, um, it's how Google's basic idea of how Google built their search engine and what you don't understand through the document, you can look up on Google and find the definition of what, it's, what it means. And that'll give you a pretty good basis of understanding how a search engine is built. So one of the things that, that really is kind of confusing for people when they break into SEO or they start working in SEO, they don't really understand the basis of, of how a search engine works and some of the issues that you have in running a search engine. That's how I would start. I would start first by trying to find a job as an intern or directly working for somebody at, at an entry level and start with what Google has to say. And also there's other resources like Bing. Bing has some resources as well. Uh, I would be careful about going, I, there's a lot of really good websites out there that, that give you a lot of good information. Just, however, some of the things that are on that website are user generated content and may not be accurate. The other issue you have is older content out on the web. And we talked earlier today about an article that was copied and published just recently, it was about keyword density, which is not something that you should be concerned about um, from that aspect. And that you have to be careful about that because the algorithms change, everything, it's, it's constantly evolving. So start with the basics and then catch up on, once you know the basics, then you can kind of determine uh, what's older articles and what's new and can kind of get the history of, of where we came from five, 10 years ago. Somebody could be talking today about something that worked five years ago that just doesn't do the same thing today or you get, you could actually hurt your website. That's, that's my two cents. Okay. Um, so we can move on. Rafiq uh, Farid asks, hi, um, Google crawled my homepage and also crawled it as index.php. Um, for example, uh, like www.example.com and www.example.com slash index.php. Um, for me, I, I only wanted to crawl um, and index the home page, uh, www.example.com. How do I tell Google not to crawl index.php and how do I redirect index.php um, to the home page? Um, 
it's just simply backslash. Can we do this through Google Webmasters? So you can set your preferred domain in Google Webmaster Tools if you like. Um, but I find it easier just to do it at a server level. Um, so you could fix this issue to start with by using a rel canonical tag on the home page and point it to the, the root domain. So while the physical page is called you know, example.com slash index.php, you point the rel canonical tag on that to um, example.com. Um, you could also get around this problem if you didn't want to use canonical tags in this particular instance using a 301 redirect. Um, and this is a pretty common issue as well where you've got, um, say, a root domain and also a www subdomain. Both of them end up getting indexed. Um, but you prefer your users to always always use one or the other. It doesn't matter which one. Um, you, can, you can fix that issue as well using a um, 301 redirect. You can implement those in in Apache using your HD access file, or if you're using IIS, you can do it with either your web config file or um, a an equivalent file to a HD access that works with um, a SAPI rewrite, um, or if you're using something like um, Lighty or one of the other web servers um, like Zeus, they also support the same sorts of concepts to be able to deliver server level um, redirects based on regular expressions or you know whatever it might be that you want to do. So that's the simplest way to do it. Um, there's lots of guides around on the internet. Obviously, if you do a search for, for instance, um, HG access canonical domain or something to that effect, you'll find help documents on the Apache website about how to do this, if, if you're using a Linux server with Apache. OK. <clears throat> Just uh, looking to find my place. I'm sorry to hold you up. Um, Uh, let me see. Tom Roberts asked a question uh, on um, local localized URLs, uh, and he's particularly keen to talk to Greek SEOs on this. Um, looking around, I don't see any Greeks here. Um, anyway, he says, where do you stand on using localized language versions of URLs? For example, you have domain.com slash example.html and domain.es slash example.html where the Spanish URL is written in English. My opinion is, is less of an SEO one than, than a user experience one. I've always assumed, um, but not really surveyed, um, that if a person was to land on a web page and saw that the URLs were written in their in their language and not just English, it might be a small sign of positive reinforcement and trust. Um, do any of you agree? Uh, now specifically for Greece, as we know, Greek does not use Romanized text. I'm not thinking of using non-ASCII two characters in the URL, um, not use diacritics, but I've heard people talk about Greeklish, that is the URL is written how a Greek pr person would pronounce the word phonetically, such as typing Heraklion for Heraklion. In general, <coughs> do Greek websites write Greek words in Romanized text, or do they just use the English spelling and translation? I um, hope that all makes sense. Well, Tom, it does make sense, but I'm not sure if we can help. Does anybody? Um, have a clue in this one? No, um, I didn't we think touched so. on this briefly before. Um, so there's, there's probably two parts to this. Um, in the case of... Uh, you should use... You should generally use the language in the URLs that your users that are seeking that content would use in general. 
Um, so if that means using the uh, the non-Romanized text of those the characters in Greek, then use those. Because what's going to happen is when people do searches um, looking for that content, they're going to search using the Greek words and phrases when they're looking for that content. They're not going to be searching in Greek fish, which means that when Google goes to highlight the URL, in the search results, if your URL is in Greeklish, but the users typed the um, the non-Romanized text, the actual Greek words for those phrases, Google's not going to highlight that in the URL. As an example, it won't bold the URL. Similarly, if you did that in the title tag, Google wouldn't highlight it in the title tag. So it makes no sense. Um, so either do it in Greek or don't do it in Greek. Like, I don't think that there's really a middle ground in this. If, if for instance, the language that you were doing it in was, um, uh, I don't know, something that was more, more based around an ASCII character set, um, like, like French, for instance. There's, there's obviously non-ASCII characters in French um, but the majority of the character set is um, ASCII. In those scenarios, you could get away with having the URLs in ASCII um, and not using the special characters that are in the French alphabet, and it probably wouldn't make a lot of difference. Because in those scenarios, doing a search for um, the French word spelt with um, the diacritics or the French word spelt without the diacritics Google's going to highlight that as you would expect in the search results because there'll actually be probably more searches happening for the phrase that doesn't include the diacritics in general. But Google will know that in both scenarios. If, on the other hand, in your instance with Greek, um, Greek doesn't use an ASCII, predominantly ASCII character set. It's like Russian. It's it's really different, or Chinese, or you know something. It's it's completely separate. So in that scenario, it, it doesn't make sense in my head that you would even bother using um, an English-based character set in those URLs. I would use Greek um, because your users are going to be searching in Greek. If, on the other hand, your Greek users are actually searching in English predominantly for whatever reason, then by all means use English. But you should be targeting your URLs, titles, content, everything about your site to the language version of the people that are looking for your content. But that's what, how I would pursue this. But, yep. um, how would you do it, Masataki? You, you... Um, in my case, I've for Japanese, I've translated the page, type, uh, page URL structure into English. It just made it easier. Uh, from management perspective, but everything else, the titles, descriptions, everything, that's obviously in Japanese. Um, and I think that's been the established um, format for m many sites. So while it's possible to have URL file names in Japanese, many companies don't. Many organizations, businesses, they don't. They either transliterate into Roman alphabet. Uh, so it's Japanese phonetically expressed in Roman alphabet, or they will translate it into English words. Um, so Wikipedia and things like that will have the UR structure in Japanese, but other than that, I haven't really come across many instances where they have done that. It's usually either transliteration or translation. One thing I've seen that that actually causes problems with um, using non-ASCII language sets with this is that um, when people copy and paste URLs into websites, um, the copy and pasted URL is not right. Um, and you end up with a URL that might visually look like it's correct. But when Google crawls the URL, you know, it's not quite right. And I've seen people having to come up and, uh, and implement elaborate URL rewriting to transform, um, you know, non the the incorrect Unicode character um, 
for the letter O into the correct Unicode encoded character for the, um, the O with the umlauts or whatever it might be, which is the actual URL. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind, I think, if um, you are going to use a non-ASCII-based character set for the URLs. Um, be very, very careful. Like before I would roll that out across an entire site, I would, for instance, push this through your content management system. I would put together some really complex URLs with a broad base, really broad cross-section of characters, maybe 100 URLs and really test out the character set for um, your given language, so Greek in your instance, um, and start copying and pasting URLs around inside your um, content management system because you know your marketing team, for instance, are going to be the people, as an example, that might be just adding content, editing content, and managing it on an ongoing basis. It might not be someone with a technical background. So it's important to make sure that as an ongoing concern that your site is in a manageable um, you know, search, um, like a healthy search space moving forward. So you might, for instance, go and create a whole bunch of these URLs, copy and paste some content around, um, create URLs in your web pages, and then go and give these things to Google and do like a fetches Google bot and see what happens. Crawl these pages with something like Screaming Frog or Xenu Link Sleuth or um, IIS SEO Toolkit or, or, or to understand what sorts of issues might arise from having, um, you know, uh, Unicode character sets and URLs that you, you know, you might not be that familiar with how they'll be handled or encoded or transcoded. Cool. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to um, uh, finish um, all of our questions tonight unless you guys would like to start another hangout uh, when this um, ends in about 10 minutes. How many questions are there left? Well, I think we've probably got about five or six. Um, Anyway, let's push on for the next one. Uh, Scott Rosier asks, can anyone offer a recommendation for an SEO company uh, which specializes in real estate websites that is reasonably priced but also does a very good job? Well, look, I'm not going to ask for the re recommendation, guys, but um, what, um, what I've done uh, now is to, because we're getting quite a few of these uh, um, on, on the um, uh, dummy SEO questions community on, on Google Plus, we're, we're getting quite a lot of job searches and, and job seekers. And so on the left-hand side of the forum, I've put a link um, to uh, posting job offers and job requests. Um, and so uh, what we'll do from now on is uh, let people just put a link in, in, in the community forum just saying that they've posted a request or a job offer. Um, but we'll, we'll keep those out, out, out of our forum because it uh, makes a bit of a mess. Um, this was another one that um, I added um, and uh, it was a, um, um, a thread uh, that posted by um, the respected uh, Pedro Diaz uh, um, who is um, uh, an almost retired Googler, he often goes back uh, to Ireland to work deep inside the machine. Um, but uh, anyway, it, this was a, 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 a link, uh, it was an article about link removal fees um, where uh, they calculated the amount of link, they didn't actually spend this money, I first thought that they actually spent the money, but they calculated the amount, the amount required would be 12k. Um, Barry Schwartz uh, made the post saying these make, make me sick um, and then Pedro uh, um, reshared uh, Barry's post and said uh, why would anyone pay this insane amount of money to scammers instead of using the free disavow tool and writing up a free and thorough reconsideration request. Um, my comment, I responded to this post and I said that the sad thing is, Pedro, that none of those things have a hope of helping him 
if it's Penguin, and it was Penguin he was trying to accommodate when he spent the 12k. It was just money down the drain. And there followed a couple of comments from Michael Martinez and uh, Richard Hearn. Um, and I said I'd uh, pay money to watch if we could get Pedro on here to, to uh, um, debate this with you guys. Um, and our number one fan, Slawomir Zudinek, uh, said that I can also add some bucks. So uh, I like Slawomir. We're on the same wavelength. Um, what do you think, guys? Um, uh, I mean, what, what irks me is that it's bad enough that they've got this this egregious um, system where, where somebody can be penalised through the actions of a malicious competitor, but now it's a sport to laugh at these people. You know, is, is that is that is that what it's coming to? It, the, the people who get hit with this stuff, and then, then it's funny to, to make fun of them while they struggle to get their websites back into profitability? Any, anyone? No? I think, I think it was Richard who made a point about Google wants to see a good faith effort, i.e., you know, you can't simply disavow everything, as it were. They want to see a certain amount of effort being put into removing the links. There is no sort of clear indication as to what that effort should consist of. Um, you know, what would be a sufficient amount of good faith effort in removing links, for example, that remains undefined for all practical purposes, as far as I can see. Yet it is quite clear that Google does demand that kind of good faith effort. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you can disavow, because disavowing everything doesn't demonstrate a good faith effort, then you have to go and try to remove certain links. And if they demand payment, what do you do? Obviously, there's no reason to believe or or, or, they, they, you, or you can't ever be certain that it is those specific links for which you may uh, have to pay that's causing the thing to uh, happen. But it, I, I, in a sense, I think the picture is far, far more complicated than um, than Google wants to paint, and that's why I think the this business model, as it were, link removal fees exists, and that taps into people's um, fear to a certain extent, uncertainty, and they um, they might be making uh, you know pretty decent amount of money, playing um, being people are being both fearful and hopeful. They fear that unless so, they do it, so, so I mean the logical the logical outcome. Um, is that um, um, here's, here's a new way to make money. You build a really crappy website, link to everybody that you can think of with um, contact details, and just wait for people to ask uh, you to un unlink them. Does anyone see that, that occurring? Yeah, I think it's, it's possible if it works. You know, it depends how the whole um, Penguin and the manual uh, spam systems work. It, it, we, you know, there are things that we don't know. Quite a lot of things that we don't know how exactly they work. So it's very difficult to say. I don't but, think it works at all. <laughs> but let's say what is real is the fear and hope of these people who are placed in a difficult situation. They are fearful that unless they do something, unless they pay, they won't recover. And they're both they're hopeful as well because they think if I pay, then I might get back. It's sort of both ways, you know, seeing, it's in a sense seeing the glass half empty and half full, but you know, there is a business model there because of huge amount of uncertainty. People might think it will work, then, and people will have to make a business decision whether to sink that money or not. And I'm pretty sure that some people will spend a substantial amount of money in a hope of changing things which may or may not be effective. And who knows, because as we've been discussing throughout this Hangout, there is 
a lack of transparency. We are not, we don't know as webmasters, you know, how Google is seeing our sites. They are given general pointers, they're given general directions, which might be helpful and in some cases are sufficient to determine the causes. Yet in many cases, they are just that. They are just vague, broad directions on which you can take all sorts of actions, not knowing which which ones were actually causing the problem. So yeah, I mean I think it is it is a far messier picture than many people appreciate and it's far messier than Google is trying to portray. That's that's my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think we'll go off the air before uh, um, we, we cover the next question. So um, um, I'd just like to, to thank you all for a really, really great hangout. I, I, I've had a lot of fun. Um, I, That's because uh, there was hand waving going on. There, well, actually, I didn't see any hand waving on, on your side, Alistair. Yeah, he um, did. He did. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. It might have been brief. Anyway, it was almost. Uh, like that. Oh my God! How he spoke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't been able to get word in Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'm having a lot of fun with these. Hey, on that last question, you know, at twelve thousand dollars, would it be? At some point, you have to ask yourself the question: Would it just be cheaper to start all over yeah. again? Yeah, I think so. I think that, then the question is: You know, is it worth spending twelve thousand dollars or whatever amount of money? You know, you could be <laughs> far smaller amount of money. But yet, you know, for some people, they think it would be worth it, you know, even though it might not work and it probably won't work. But well, you know, well part of the question, ever fearful. part of the question is, is even if you spend twelve grand, doesn't guarantee that you're going to get your rankings back. No. So it's not like, hey, I spent twelve grand to get my rankings back, and I, you know, whatever your revenue was before the penalty, um, you know, you're. More than likely, you're not going to get your rankings back. You're yeah. disavowing all these links. If it if the dis, if the disavow tool works and you disavow a bunch of links, you're probably going to be losing some of that page rank flowing to your site, which means you're not going to go up in the rankings as much as what you were before. So then you would have to build actually more links, and now you're back into the same cycle. And how much revenue was your site making in the first place? So really have to think hard about whether it would be worth doing that because you